Good evening. Is that coming through? Okay. Are you able to hear me now? Yours were yours. All right. Oh. Is it better now? How about that? There we go. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and call our meeting to order. So welcome to our PBSD special board meeting. We have translation available in Spanish. If you need that support, please see Virginia Gonzalez in the back. Uh, Virginia, can you raise your hand? There you go. Um, if you would like to speak to an item on the agenda, uh, then please complete a speaker card and place it in the basket at the end of the stage prior to the start of the agenda item. Each speaker will have two minutes. And we know that it is easy to lose track of time, especially if you are unaccustomed to speaking in public. So um, rather than cutting, just cutting people off at the two minute mark, Vice President Shocker will hold up a 30 second uh, reminder card just so you can gather your thoughts and, and wrap things up. Mm. And I know we have you know, quite a few new faces here this evening, so I just want to take a moment to establish some ground rules and that there is likely to be differences of, in opinion, um, sometimes strong differences, and please give those who are speaking the same respect that you would like to receive when you are speaking. That will allow everyone to be heard and the board to conduct its business. So I'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance, and I would like to ask uh, Trustee Orozco to lead us in the pledge, please. All right, thank you. So we'll move to item 4.1, approval of the agenda. Can I have a motion? Oh. I'd like to make a motion to amend the agenda. I'd like to make a motion to amend the agenda. So I would um, like to make a motion to extend comments to one hour per item, 5.1, 6.1, 6.2. Great, thank you very much. So if we can go ahead and put up the PowerPoint, that would be great. Perfect. Okay, so tonight, um, this afternoon, this evening, we're going to be speaking about um, a few things. We're going to first, I'm first going to speak to the historical context in the initial July 2020 board decision, kind of remind everyone what had happened at that point. I will be discussing several research regarding the benefits, challenges, and impacts of school resource officers. Um, then Ms. Chouse is going to speak to data on suspensions and expulsions, also data from stakeholder surveys and the recent thought exchange that we had. Um, talk about the various roles that we have that's linked to student safety. Um, and then we'll be going over other proposed safety measures. And lastly, we will be talking about staff recommendations for future next steps. Um, so I just want to orient us to the historical context of what had happened previously. So we did introduce SROs um, at Watsonville High School in 1994. Um, there actually was a 10-year delay, and then 
Um, there was an introduction of, to PVHS and Aptos High in 2004. Um, there was, um, out between the months, um, probably prior to this as well, but um, specifically just looking at emails and conversations that we had, there was a real call to action from the community um, between April and June of 2020, um, of really speaking to the request and the need to remove SROs from our, our campuses. Um, so the initial happened on June 24, 2020. Um, staff did present a presentation on research, um, suspension expulsion data, risk management data, um, and then at that time we also had a June 2020 survey data. Um, we also held um, various student voice listening sessions, probably our largest occurred um, with myself on July 7th. Um, so myself and also staff participated in a listening session with our students. Um, regarding the presence of SROs. Um, at that point, um, the students very much um, voiced for the most part a desire to um, remove SROs um, from campus and you'll see that also in the stakeholder feedback survey um, that I'm gonna show you in a minute. So July 9th to July 15th, um, we, we asked all stakeholders to provide us their input on the effectiveness of SROs and also the benefits and impacts of SROs. Um, and then the board did take final board action on um, July 22nd to remove SROs at that point um, indefinitely from PVUSD schools. Um, so I just wanted to go over the data quickly that this is um, from July 2020. Um, so you'll see there are three principal groups um, and you'll see that there's varying degrees of um, feeling that it makes them safe and also being comfortable with presence of SROs. Um, so initially the board um, very much was, um, listen, it was very um, in tune with what the students were saying for the most part. Um, and you can see from the graph that's up um, that for the most part it was about a third, a third, a third, um, slightly off, but um, about a third, a little over a third um, said that they agreed um, that SROs made them feel safe. Um, a, a little over a third disagreed and then there was a little less than a third um, that was neutral on the point. Um, when we looked at how comfortable they were with the presence of SROs, talking about students and former students, um, the same breakdown basically occurred um, with a third, a third, and a third. Um, where we see some differences um, is in terms of the other stakeholders. Um, so when we looked at um, teachers and staff, and this was specifically teachers and staff at the three comprehensive high schools, so I want to make that point that this didn't, um, this was disaggregated and included only staff members at the three um, comprehensive high schools. Um, you'll see that it, when we look at this, um, that the, the majority of staff, at, at least at that point in July 2020, um, believe that um, SROs did make them feel safer. Um, you did have 22% that disagreed and 21% that were neutral. Um, and then a grand majority felt that they were, they felt comfortable with having an SRO on campus. Um, it then again um, shifted um, when we looked at community members. Um, and so community members um, ranked um, a little under half, so 46% said that they agreed with having SROs making them feel safer um, versus 34% that said that they disagreed and 18% um, and that said that they were neutral on the point. Um, and that mirrored pretty close to how they felt um, with the presence of the SROs. And I mentioned that just to provide perspective because it has been a year since that occurred. Um, but really what we see within our own survey data is what we are seeing in the research itself. So um, the research is, um, and all of this just for the public to be aware, all of these are actually on our board doc. So if you wanted to refer to them, the source is down at, at the bottom. So the only one that really um, had more of a, a balanced um, 
um, findings was the congressional report from 2013. Um, so it, it just spoke to the conflicting conclusions. So it spoke to two different things. One, it spoke to the fact that um, SROs are most likely um, to arrest for low level offenses. Um, and they also um, can deter students from committing assaults on campus as well as bringing weapons. Um, they did believe that some of the activities um, can contribute to school safety as well. Um, and that was again in 2013. Um, if you go to other sources, there is an abundance of other sources um, that really speak to um, the detriment of having SROs on campus. Um, and specifically, this one is the Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. Um, I think the main difference is it specifically um, is, uh, has more detrimental effects for students of color and students from vulnerable student populations. Um, and so they cite how SROs do not improve school safety or reduce school violence. Um, also how students um, feel actually less safe and more fearful at school with SROs. Um, and that SROs do lead to more expulsions and suspensions. Um, and um, similar to what the last research, um, that they also tend to criminalize and arrest youth for minor misbehavior. Um, and um, that a lot of times they're involved in school discipline that's not um, where no crime has been committed. This one, um, I think, is um, a really interesting study because I believe that um, it speaks to um, context matters. So this specifically is from SAGE. It's a, it's a very recent study. It was released just this year in 2021. Um, and it really speaks to um, the broader context. And what they found was that there are contextual features that shape um, independent or individual behavior. So how an SRO behaves on a campus is directly linked to three elements. One, security measures, two, exclusionary practices, and three, restorative practices. And so um, what, what they find is when a school is focused on um, exclusionary practices and safety measures, um, such as um, metal detectors or other things that generally feel like children are being criminalized, um, that the SROs respond in that same manner. So if, if they feel as if there is a hard um, security line, then they come in and they actually behave in that manner versus if the school district and the school itself is engaged in restorative practices, then they come in um, with a different stance. Um, so I really think that this research um, speaks to the importance of um, training and um, the roles that are established matters. Um, and um, we definitely, um, if, if we don't have, a fo if we have a focus on exclusionary practices, which is suspensions and expulsions, and we don't fa focus on restorative practices, what will happen is um, SROs will take a reactive and law enforcement approach that will lead to poor student outcomes. Um, and so we need to, um, be aware of that and be mindful, be mindful on that. Um, then this is for um, ACLU, um, cops and no counselors. You know, I think this is, this is really what the, the board was um, at that time. Um, we didn't have the additional one-time monies and so the board really had to make the decision of where should that allocation of resources go. Um, so this from ACLU really speaks to the fact that, and I still firmly believe this to be true, that um, school-based mental health providers do improve attendance, do lower suspension and expulsion rates, and in fact, do in fact improve school safety. Um, and um, the ACLU um, cited that there's no evidence that police in school actually improve school safety. Um, and in their research actually leads to greater student alienation and a poorer school climate. 
And I think something that I pointed out earlier is if you are from a vulnerable student population, you, most, you will have a likelier chance of having a negative interaction. Um, unless we do something to change the context in which um, SROs are in the schools. And so students with disabilities are arrested at a 2.9 times more than a student that isn't have a, doesn't have a disability. Latinx students are arrested at 1.3 times of that of white students. Um, black and Latino boys with disabilities, 3% um, versus um, are just 3% of the population, but are 12% of all school arrests, um, which really leads to, um, to the um, disparity in data. So this, is, um, this speaks to the mental health needs um, that we were talking about. So it came up, it has come up um, through that Aptos um, um, death of how does, um, social emotional counselors, mental health clinicians, how do they actually help with the safety of students? And so what we know is that, um, that mental health disorders are prevalent among youth that are involved in, um, in the justice system and that the a majority, two thirds of all the student, all the youth that's in detentions or correctional settings do have a diagnosable a mental health disorder. So when we're thinking about upstream services, when we're thinking about how do we support students, then us continuing to place the importance on social emotional needs um, is paramount and can actually decrease aggression, restlessness, hyperactivity, and that is all um, correlated to um, youth violence. Um, I do want to note just because um, it will be important that you can have a mental health disorder and not um, be part of the juvenile justice system and likewise. Um, however, um, they, do, um, they do very much um, go hand in hand. So now I just wanna talk a little bit about um, what our students are saying in terms of what they need. So I've been meeting with student groups. Um, this um, happened last week. I met with the Empower Watsonville student group. And um, these were their exact words. Um, and so I know the, the board cares very much what students are saying. And so I wanted to provide this perspective. So they, they feel like they're, even though, and we'll speak to the numbers in a minute, even though we've increased dramatic, dramatically the number of um, social emotional counselors, mental health clinicians in the district, that there's not enough counselors in the district um, and that they're not able when needed um, to make an immediate, um, make an appointment. They have to make an appointment and they don't have immediate support. Um, and they also spoke to the wellness centers. So those that have been tracking the district know that we're gonna be opening up our new wellness centers um, they're just they they're just talking about them not being available to students at all times, and really looking to extend those uh, those drop-in hours. Um, and their recommendation was until at least um, 5 p.m. Um, and then their other recommendation was that they believe that we needed to provide more mental health training for teachers and staff. So we have we have started the year with the restorative start, um, but we need um, from their perspective we need to continue. Um, to provide that training. And we knew that this was important because of the data that we had received from students previously. So I just wanna put this information out there because there was a opt-ed that came out that had um, highly inaccurate data. Um, so we have not had any reductions um, over the last five years. We have only increased um, in social emotional support. Um, so we have had a, a, small, de a small increase in um, high school counselors. So now we have 23, which is a 10% increase since 2018. Um, we do now have 17 social emotional counselors, which is a 55% increase since 2018. Um, we now have 14 mental health clinicians. That's where we've been putting most of our focus um, because they can provide therapeutic support to our students. Um, and we have had a 180% increase um, since 2018. 
And then we also have increased school psychologists by 12% and we have 19 of them. Um, this just kind of shows you another um, version of the social emotional support over time. And um, you'll see that we did hire our first set of social emotional counselors in, 20, um, in 2006. In 2020, we did um, decide to use the monies for, from the SRO contracts to hire one mental health clinician um, at each high school, which did occur. Um, then in August 2020, we expanded PVPSA services for non-Medi-Cal students and families. So before, um, if you made over a certain limit and you were not part of Medi-Cal, then you would not have been able to receive services from PVPSA. Um, between June and August of 2021, um, we hired um, one additional academic counselor. So I just saw her today. So she is, um, she is at Renaissance and New School. We hired five additional um, social emotional counselors to reduce the ratio at elementary and middle school. Um, and then we hired one additional mental health clinician using federal one-time funding. Um, between August 9th and 12th, we did our restorative start for our staff and families. Um, and then December 2021, we will be adding one additional mental health clinician for our wellness center, which will be opening prior to um, the winter break um, for, um, for our wellness center at EA Hall. And now um, Ms. Chaus is going to um, speak to some data. And, and while you're passing that off, I just want to remind members of the public that you know, uh, county and CDPH guidelines um, require masks while indoors. Thank you. Good evening, President uh, Holm, Dr. Rodriguez, Board of Trustees. Um, I have the pleasure today of giving you kind of the data behind where our kids are currently at, uh, some history of where they've been with suspensions and expulsions, and really some of the factors that have played into this. So uh, we had a very successful pilot with Sown to Grow. Sown to Grow is a platform-based program that actually does check in pieces with our students. Uh, we piloted over the summer and we launched with the restorative start pieces. Uh, you can see up there about 5,200 students are currently in. The data is reflecting when a student and teacher have engaged in at least one data point or more, uh, and in addition to up to three data points in a month. So again, as you see kind of the initiation of a first start with Sown to Grow, you can look over to the right-hand side. A lot of interest in how our kids are currently doing from their voice. So important to look at what our students are feeling. You can see to the right-hand side, you'll see a range of that dark green, which is the very happy, and then happy right underneath that. So it's the green band really that we're trying to get to. On the left-hand side is PVUSD. So you'll see over 50% of our, our folks are feeling very happy or happy. So to the right of that, for referencing of other districts that are using similar softwares to Sown to Grow, you'll see the right, which is where other districts started this year. So same time frame. Our kids, um, and I, I think it's a testament to the amount of connection that staff had during the pandemic, but you are seeing that um, not, not all is ill out there either. So our kids are feeling happy and re-engaged with their sites in addition to. This is also from Sown to Grow. So what you'll see up there is the breakdown of sites. So on the left-hand side, what you're trying to really uh, get to is looking at a five. So the top mark is five in terms of their happiness rating. Each one of those sites calculates it for all of the students that are involved in it. To the right hand side, you'll see what the district emotional scale read. So with all of our sites, all 31 sites included, they're reading at about a 3.8, uh, just in that line of happiness. And again, you can see kids are, are depending on site, uh, you know, their factors may have changed, their environmental factors may have changed. We don't know exactly what's occurred for each one of our students. But what this allows us to do is to get to a targeted support and actually provide additional supports to sites that we may not be seeing the same outcomes from. Follow up to Sown to Grow. So at this point, we have three sites, uh, Lakeview, Wixa, and Alianza, that have completed a post survey. So how this works is our students have a pre-survey. Everybody in the district has done the pre-survey at this point 
in terms of the, the 5,200 students that you saw. So if they are in the system and actively using it, they've done the pre-survey. What you are seeing in this particular example is the pilot piece of the three additional sites that have now done a post. So what that means is that there's been either a curriculum or an SEL lesson or additional pieces from either Sewn to Grow or teachers also did additional lessons in between and then ran a post survey. So uh, highlighting and noting a couple of things here, when you take a look at where the growth was in, in initial impact. So again, short amount of time since we've been back to school, but if you take a look at these two bands and take a look at what those look like. So I know my, when my feelings are making it hard for me to focus and I know what my strengths are. So if you recall, our restorative practices pieces when we came back were around identity, belonging, and agency. Those are two attributing factors to those pieces. To the right-hand side, you'll also see some places that are identified in growth for us. So we haven't seen the substantial gain in terms of what that will look like, but what we are seeing is what our kids are feeling. They're not exactly sure how to calm themselves down at times. They also may not be able to completely name what they are feeling. So again, that self-awareness and that social awareness of what we're currently coping with still has room uh, for us to continue to work through it. But these pieces of pre and post allow us to see also the effect of what kind of lessons we're providing so we know where to go next. So I want to re-emphasize what Dr. Rodriguez said, which is that suspensions are not restorative. So suspensions are necessary at times, but they are also not restorative. And if they're not coupled with corrective measures and actual supports, they're actually hazardous and end up going the opposite direction for our kids. A few pieces, and I, I will highlight some, some pieces that if you recall, I've actually mentioned these several times to the board in other presentations. Our system in Synergy came on in this, this year in between. So as we launched into 17, that's really when we started to move from eSchools into Synergy completely. So I wanna preface this piece of the data of years prior to, they're a compilation of what we were able to pull from eSchools and hard copies at times. So the system and the structure really was not built to read the same things that we're reading from 17, 18 on. So to give you an example of what that looks like, prior suspensions, there were pieces that were not, in fact, all of our pieces at that point were not tied to ed code. So that basically means that any of the suspensions that occurred from 2013 up until the point of 16, 17, it doesn't mean that they were necessarily coded to an ed code violation, which means you may have gotten something in there like a third grader that hit somebody on a playground and it's marked as a hit, or somebody that is doing a lot of disruptive behavior and somebody suspended them, which actually is not allowable at this point after 2009. So some of these pieces that you're seeing was the realignment of us moving to a better student information system that was capturing those things. But I also wanna caution you to, to realize that there may not be directly apples to apples in this particular case. Um, what I will note is that when you are taking a look at the transition of data, the 939, if you will, that's up there, also important to look at per capita. So what does that really mean? So the 939, if you were to use the district enrollment at the time, is about 18% of our students at that time period were being suspended for one thing or another in a high school level. You can also run down to probably our most closest year prior to COVID, the 18-19 school year uh, was at 13-13, so that's a 5.9% suspension rate. So gravity of moving from an 18% to a 5.9 is incredible for a district to move in that direction. It also is relative to what you're seeing in these declines, we're looking at what are we implementing and trying differently versus just doing suspension. Um, again, you will see a missing year there, that is COVID year, so 2021, there really is no data to, for us to be able to project um, into that piece. We did not suspend students during virtual space, as you will. Um, I don't know that it would have changed their environment at that point. A couple of other pieces. So again, you can see a little bit of a, a difference in the graphing of what happened in middle schools. Um, I was, and several other people were not necessarily here during that 16, 17 year, but there are some attributing factors. So when I did talk to administrators too in regards to why some of the glyphs and the, the bumps, again, you were at 986, which was 27.7% of 
of our middle school kids. So almost a third when you think about the number of kids that were being suspended in 2013 and then drastically obviously dropping to the 569 and then ultimately the, the 61. 61 in all fairness, it's year to date. So if you were to project that out, springtime is a little bit heavier than not. Uh, if you were to project that out over four quarters, you're looking at about 240. But again, those things have not happened and we don't also wish them to happen. So, uh, but in trajectory, you'll see again, the band growth of each one of our schools and they are highlighted above within their school, their school color in terms of what that looks like. You'll also note that in the 17-18 school year, the, I know that the board is familiar with this, but for those that are not, in the 17-18 school year, we also received funding from the low performing block grant. The low performing block grant was actually identified for middle schools for this exact effect. It was looking at what are we doing academically with math, English, and culture and climate, if you remember. So heavy emphasis was put on what are we doing with PBIS and our tiered fidelity inventories to really look at why is this occurring and why are they still so high. Couple of pieces in regards to expulsions. So these pieces are framed between uh, high school and middle school. So again, a couple of pieces in regards to data points. These are years prior to us having the data collected. These are hard copies. So essentially school districts are required to have a certain number of years back of hard copies of expulsions. Um, we did go through those files that are generally housed in student services departments. Um, and you can see up there, four and four. I, again, uh, as far back as we could go with the files that we had that were not electronic at that point in time. You'll also see the heavy lines up here. So the longer lines with the, the little uh, flagpole, if you will, at the top, that is the total number throughout the district. So if you take a look at the top lines up here, you'll also see the schools represented in terms of the number of expulsions that they have had and represented. In the district level, you will see there was 57 expulsions in the 14-15 in the school year, followed by 15-16 at 42, 29 and 16-17, 35, 14, and then three in that year prior, uh, right at COVID line. So uh, again, a couple of attributing factors to expulsions that you all should be aware of. There are five majors. So five major expulsion components are mandatory. So there is nothing that you can do in corrective measures. There is nothing that you offer in restorative practices. Those five have to come to the board as a full expulsion. Any other offense, so those are top five offenses. So firearms um, are one of them, explosives, et cetera. Um, those are the top five that regardless of what has been done in corrective action, they do end up coming to the board as an expulsion. Any other offense in Ed Code has to meet two measures. Those two measures are that other means of correction are not feasible, meaning what did we do to support a student and put something in place? So you'll see things like behavior plans. You'll see things like check in and check out. You'll see things like we've provided counseling or referrals. Those are all corrective measures. They're not always used, but they must be offered and we must actually try to change the behavior in a different way other than a punitive function. And then the last one is in the second measure of, of the dual piece in the expulsion line is, does the act that the student committed end up resulting in something that presents a danger to others if they were to return? So those are the two double measures of anything else outside of those top five. Within physical encounters, we'll take a look at a couple of pieces, both in high school line and middle school line. So within the high school line, and I'll point out very quickly because I know that if I'm Watsonville High, I always think the same thing too. There's things in per capita. So I, I wanna caution people to read this and not really truly understand it. So if you were to read this at naked eye and just go, my goodness, you can clearly see Watsonville High's numbers are higher. That's not a per capita drive. So when you do a per capita, you're taking the total number of offenses and then you are actually dividing that by their total population. So as you know, Watsonville High is at 2,100, 2,300, depending on the year. So those are calculated a little bit differently. So if you were to look at it in just this effect, you would clearly see that they look like they are higher than the normal uh, students. In per capita, I'll take one of the years and show you what that breakdown would look like. So in the 2018, 2019 school year, that per capita rating for Watsonville High would have been a 6.2. 
PV high would have been at a 5.6, and aptos high would have been at a 2.1. So that gives you kind of a parameter as to what it looks like to break it down, not just by sheer offense, but what does that mean in the actual total population or enrollment. Same is true of our middle school encounters. So middle school encounters, and I should also note that uh, as we're talking through this, some of the codes that were found within eSchools, again, this category uh, had probably over 12 different taglines. Uh, it could be fight, it could be fight battery, it could be slap, it could be hit, it could be inappropriate conduct, exclamation and exclamation. So a lot of work has been done in uh, the, the correlation of moving from eSchools to Synergy to standardize this. So you will see some of the impacts of doing that too. We need to log things. We need to know what the actual accurate story is in order to actually be able to do something about the story. So again, as you kind of look through the data, you are beginning the years of really our first three years prior to COVID of having, you know, what I would consider going into, um, what I would consider going into a student information system appropriate and in alignment with what your ed code lines are, which is what you really want to see over trajectory and time and lines. Couple of other pieces, so these are formal threat assessments. So formal threat assessments, many people know them because they sometimes hit social media and that rises to the occasion. It essentially is somebody that has made a comment, it could also be a group, has made a comment and a direct threat to an individual on a school campus, could be a principal, AP, could be another student. It also could be the ones that you guys have probably seen most recently in regards to kids making comments out loud about harming a school. So when you make a comment out loud that actually follows, uh, falls underneath 48900.7, it's considered a threat. It's a direct threat to the community and the school community. What that means is that uh, the school district, counselors, mental health, and law enforcement are all involved in that threat, and they have to assess the viability of it. So it's the district's response that through the threat assessment, if that is heard and we know that, it automatically goes to law enforcement as well. It is used as really a, a bandwidth of multiple professionals in that area to decide, did they have viability? Did they have the options to actually conduct that? Um, and again, with social media, I would I'd certainly caution people and also use it as an educational point for parents to be cautious of what your students also say. Um, a lot of times kids say things that they don't necessarily mean. We treat every threat the same way. And unfortunately, that is very hard to restore kids back to their communities and their settings when they've said something that they may have thought was a joke, it's, it's not a joke. So please take the opportunity also to help your students know that and know the difference. A couple of other pieces, uh, survey data that just went out in September of 2021, looked at a couple of different areas. You'll see up there that there were 2,000, 2,269 uh, folks that responded to it. Of that, 62% were parents or guardians, 19% uh, were staff members, and then also students of 17%. And what was generally asked in this piece was looking at, as you've returned to school, what are the health and safety pieces that you are in need of? So if you take a look to the right-hand side there, a couple of things over 50% line, so I will hold those for you really quickly, but as you can tell, they're all very similar in nature in terms of how many responses were made. So those over 50% were additional campus supervisors, additional security cameras, and better communication systems, trailing very closely behind between the range of 43.3% and 46.1% were additional social, emotional, and mental health services, presence of school resource officers and emergency training with Alice. The same survey also indicated the impacts of COVID. So up here you'll see how much impact did it have with our students. Uh, you will also notice that uh, three is about the midsection, right? So anything to the right hand side, five means that it really truly impacted them in a big way. If you add those two pieces together, both four and five, which lean to that right-hand side of it, it significantly impacting them, you're at 50%. 50% um, of our students and families that responded to this indicated that it was significant impact in their household for mental health. 
The other piece that is obviously of caution is that three. So the three sits on the fence, sometimes are better, some are not. So again, more students that we definitely need to be clearly aware of so that we don't actually push one way or the other. Um, also reflected in trauma care. So how are we receiving kids and how are we working through that to make sure that we service that need before it uh, heads in the opposite direction. You'll also see down here the impact on academic learning. Again, four and five significant impact. That was at 47.4% if you add those two pieces together. So you're roughly sitting around that 50% line again with just as many in that third band. We also had another format, so outside of survey, we moved through thought exchange feedback. Thought exchange feedback is a platform base that allows participants to use their thoughts and then other participants to weigh in on what those thoughts are. So it's almost as if you are having a dialogue with others where you can say, yeah, I actually agree with that too, or no way, I, I don't agree with that. And you have different ranking buttons that allow you to do that. Up here you can see the total return from September 7th through the 13th, we had 955 participants. Of those participants, we had just over 1,000 thoughts that they gave in regards to uh, where we are at with uh, school safety and mental health pieces. Over the, those same 955 people marked over 12,000 ratings and responses in addition to. So the word cloud that you're seeing, this is what's referred to as a word cloud. Those words popped out in more of their feedback than not. So uh, this is generated directly from their feedback. So the more that you actually see a term, the more that it will actually show up within the word cloud itself. Little deeper dive into that data. So within the thought exchange piece itself, it also allows us to create and look at what those themes actually are based on the feedback from, from the participants. So a few pieces uh, that may resonate with people that they, they are aware of, campus safety monitors, those are campus supervisors, yard duties, et cetera, so supervision of such. SROs included law enforcement, WPD, sheriff, et cetera, so any references that were in regards to that. COVID and safety measures included uh, testing, masks, et cetera. Caring staff, so caring staff was actually a deliverable of folks asking that the adults that are caring for our kids and our families are receptive and warm. What they were asking for was a level that you, you see what we've gone through and you can connect with us. So it was highlighted by multiple families that they want to feel kind with teachers, with staff, with principals. They overall want to have an experience where they feel welcomed and warmed. You also have a couple of other pieces here. The increase in communication was also highlighted. You saw that in the initial survey as well. Comprehensive school safety plan actually referred to the discipline policies or bullying aspects uh, that have come up or egress, ingress, uh, exiting and entrance of schools for proper care. Um, other, other fell into, it may not have necessarily been attributed to mental health directly or safety and security. These were pieces uh, such as substitutes, class size or online schooling. So things like virtual academy needs and those pieces. Mental health, mental health clinicians. This also called out the need for, uh, in several comments and highly rated comments, they were asking for additional training too for teachers in regards to really making sure that they understand what those needs are in a better way to be able to assist with students. A no idea generated. Down here it was a thank you or appreciation of us sending out the, um, the survey to ask and then you have counseling right here on the end. So again, attributing to your top themes. So now it got into the place of folks being able to really rank those things. So all those rankings, those 12,000 rankings, here are the top rankings. So a score of five is really the highest of the rankings that we get. Um, very much so plateaued across the board, meaning folks really do have a, a significant need for many of these pieces. It does tail off the two pieces that are highlighting tonight that we're discussing that are uh, connected as well are going to be those campus safety monitors as well as school resource officers and also mental health. So one of the things that the program and the platform does is it looks for folks that rank similar items. And then what came out of that was that the majority of folks that ranked the same item 
were around SROs on campus and mental health. So in this particular case, you had 190 folks make comments and rankings in association with SROs, and 53 folks really looking at the mental health aspects of what those needs are too. So the way that you read this is to the left-hand side, these are the sides in the comments that generated uh, the most energy around rankings of the community. Um, and what you will see here is essentially um, the, the number one piece that came up was concern during school hours uh, to make sure that their son was um, taken care of and that police presence would provide safety. So again, other parents and other students also indicate that as a high ranking and then uh, police officers up here you also see as a high rating. On the flip side, you will see mental health clinicians uh, and mental health in general. Uh, this piece was uh, essentially no permanent police presence. Uh, we do not draft these, these are our direct comments from folks. Um, we need to better address how to ensure everyone's well-being. A lot of research shows SROs don't reduce school violence. And then the last one, no SRO in schools, armed police are dangerous to black and brown students. These two also were highly rated according to our rankings. Interestingly enough, what both groups called out, so it didn't matter whether you had reference side A or side B, both sets actually highlighted these two at a high frequency, which was the need to really truly have caring and attentive staff and also communication systems that parents also felt uh, worked more efficiently. And with that, a couple of things as we go into some, some possibilities or some options that you may have. Uh, it's important to understand as we're talking through these some roles of various people that are actually linked to the direct uh, student safety piece. So you'll see up here the campus supervisors and the mental health clinicians. These are both specific to their job titles and job descriptions. So in this case, you will see our campus safety and security officers that are on each one of our uh, high school campuses as well. They're there to, to really provide a safety and a support. They assess, they monitor, uh, they generally uh, work their way kind of in with, with our kids. They're very knowledgeable uh, about seeing our kids on a frequent basis. But their oversight really is to look at being a problem solver. So they may be assigned to certain areas, they may be developing and observing uh, certain pieces that are, are occurring, and they also prepare uh, reports or records um, in order to be able to kind of assist us in moving forward. They are what, it, what I would say parents are most accustomed to seeing when you actually end up going on a campus. Mental health specialist, so in our case, there's a couple of different ways that we provide this, and it actually breaches out even further to our academic counselors as well at times. So many of them have the same credential line as well as our social emotional counselors. But in this case, it's highlighted that the mental health clinicians and the social emotional counselors, they provide um, really three different areas. So one, it's the mental health support to individuals, groups, so we do group sessions as well, and families that are in direct service or crisis. We also take a look at participating as part of the, part of the public and the school team. So they generally work on our multidisciplinary teams, our wellness committees, um, those pieces that uh, really generally require somebody to have a high level of expertise in this area. So SSTs, IEPs, they also go to, and then compliance and maintenance of files and those records to make sure that we are getting um, and meeting those professional and ethical standards. And then lastly, SROs, so school resource officers. Uh, SROs uh, responsibilities, this definition was taken from the congressional study uh, that Dr. Rodriguez referenced earlier. There are three major functions, so the safety expert and law enforcer, making arrest, issuing citations on campus, taking actions against unauthorized persons on school property, responding to off-campus criminal activities, and serving as responders in the event of a critical incident. Secondly, they're also there as a problem solver and a liaison to the community resources, developing and expanding crime prevention efforts and community justice initiatives for students. And then lastly, it's indicated as uh, an educator. And again, that reference and definition is from the congressional study shared with you guys. Some other proposed safety measures. So there are three, uh, and then I will pass it back to Dr. Rodriguez. These three specifically look at restorative practices. So if you actually recall, I believe it was last week, we were at our general board meeting. Um, our student services director, Rick Ito, and myself spoke to restorative practices. 
Um, that is a pilot piece that we are putting in place. Uh, this actually would allow us, uh, if, if approved as one of the options, this would allow us to actually begin working um, at a more expeditious rate to be able to include more of our schools in the, the process. The, the major factor in this, and if you look at the connection, this is a tier two support within PBIS. It covers options, so we need to be able to have options for different types of interventions, and then 2.7, so this is that framework piece of PBIS, also that the practices match what the students need. So again, the, the difference between suspending and then moving in a direction that actually allow us to meet the needs and to repair harm and repair relationships versus having students, um, you know, be off campus and not be, uh, you know, present to be able to have that connection with us. In addition, the center line is the student success project. I also spoke uh, to you guys recently about this piece. This piece actually is a project through Santa Cruz County Probation. It currently is at three of our sites, uh, PV High, Renaissance, and New School. Uh, it's currently through a grant, so it's not a district grant, it's actually a probation grant, grant um, that was submitted and we were partners within that, so it's allowed us to have those services. The extension though, and this is a, a possibility, is to extend that partnership with probation to include Aptos and Watsonville High. Important to notice, this, these are, uh, they do not cite students, they don't have the ability to cite students in this case. So what this really is, is looking at, the, the program focuses on the prevention function. It looks at the strength assets of each one of the kids. It does goal setting, it assesses their social emotional needs, provides supports outside, and also does family and parent engagement wraparound. Uh, it serves both probation and non-probation youth. So again, uh, they've been a part of our wellness uh, over the past, two years um, at the schools that they're currently at and have had much success. We're currently evaluating what the cost would look like in order to be able to uh, do another piece with uh, Watsonville and Aptos as well. And then lastly, additional campus supervisors and training. In this proposal, uh, we would be looking at adding one additional full-time campus supervisor to the three high schools. Uh, in addition, uh, most recently, SB 390 was an addendum to SB 1626. So 1626 actually said that if you worked in a security guard function on a campus and worked more than 20 hours a week, you needed to make sure that you had uh, some additional training to do so. In July 1 of 2021, which was just recently here, 390 passed, which was to basically say that regardless of how long your work hours are, if you are in the, the session of supervising students or on a campus, you must actually go through the, the post course. So in this case, for those of you guys that are not aware, peace officer standards and training, those focus areas that are required, looks at the, the role and responsibility of school security officers, the laws and liabilities, security awareness in an educational environment, mediation and conflict resolution, disasters and emergencies, dynamics of student behavior, and there actually is a requirement for that one hour exam in order to be able to receive that post uh, training cert. In addition, you'll see at the bottom here, I referenced it in an earlier uh, session during one of our community forums. So district safety and security walkthrough tool. So our comprehensive school safety plans, there is not a tool uh, that the CDE or the Department of Education has had around this other than a checklist. Uh, what we've actually been able to do, and I've had success with this also in other areas, is to be able to use that and combine it with our Homeland Security piece on the guide to K-12 school security. What it allows us to do is look at eight factors that are common that can be assessed at any time. So what this would allow is it would allow our campus supervisors to look through these eight modules in real time on a campus. So as students may be in, in, in periods actively in classrooms and you have coverage, you could have one of our campus supervisors as well as our APs, principals, nurses, anybody else that, that is uh, really living in the, this space has the opportunity to be able to do these modules. What this setup would allow us to do, and there's no cost associated with that piece, what that setup allows us to do is more frequency of checking these pieces, whether it is access control, all the way down to school culture, communications, or the security equipment that a campus has. It also allows us to move those forward to MNO and other folks that can assist us in prioritizing um, the alteration and the fixes of those. Approximate cost outside here, 
That is largely in part due to the salary lines, which includes the, st the statutories and benefits of the additional campus supervisors, and then the training costs associated with each one of the members that we would have in this space. And with that, I will be passing it back to Dr. Rodriguez. the board what they find is that all of these proposed safety measures and the ones that I'll be speaking to on the next slide are directly related to the survey data and the research that we found so when you think about when we talked about the context and how the context matters it specifically spoke to restorative practices and the need to have restorative practices be a base on a school campus the Student Success Project really speaks to our need to continue to provide upstream um, services to our students, and then the campus supervisors was one of the main areas in which um, our families um, requested that we continue to move forward. So then you continue to look at the other proposed measures. One of them is improved self-service, specifically at Aptos High School. Um, we, there actually was a conversation prior to my arrival in terms of uh, the self-service, so we are able to effectively do that. Um, we have just recently, just within the last um, week or two, we have reached out to both Verizon and AT&T, and they are able to um, provide additional self-service for us um, through many cell towers. Um, I just want to note that um, I believe it was in 2015, so right before my arrival, there was um, conversation about that and there was decision not to put the mini cell towers in the schools, um, And this, but this would be an option for us and there would be no cost to us. Um, we maybe even could um, figure out if there was a way that we could have some type of funding back to us and associated with us, but because this would provide service throughout the Aptos area, that area, um, then there would be no cost to us. We also looked at two different things in terms of the camera system. Um, so I do wanna note that the cell service is specifically for Aptos, but everything else that we're discussing in terms of the proposed safety measures are for all three comprehensive high schools. Um, so improvements to the security system, security camera system. Um, we have been upgrading both the cameras and the infrastructure um, for many years. This would be us adding an additional 25% um, coverage at the three sites um, and really um, continuing to improve our current servers. So an example of what that would mean, um, Aptos High currently has 39 um, cameras, we would increase that to 50, which would allow us to increase the specific coverage. Um, that increase of the 25% coverage would be about $150,000. Um, it would just be a one-time expense. We are looking also at software, which we can actually integrate with our current system. So there is software, um, surveillance software that allows for texting alerts. So for example, if a student is in an area um, that shouldn't have um, um, traffic at that point. Um, there can be texting alerts. Um, there can be advanced um, searching capabilities. So um, facial recognition, um, pattern recognition, um, and then also object um, detection recognition. Um, we weren't able within these last two weeks to find an exact cost, um, but we were able to confirm that we're able to use our current cameras, um, which definitely will bring down the, the, the cost. Um, we also heard from our families that one of the things that was really important to them and students was communication systems, so how can we improve that? Um, we, this actually is not on there, but what one thing that we are going to do is develop a buddy system. So when we, we do have a text and email and all call system for families, um, what we did not have in place was someone double checking that the message went out to the right to the intended party. Um, and so we are going to start that buddy system. 
Um, but there also is the RAVE uh, mobility safety app. So I'll kind of explain what, what that would be. Um, so every staff member on, on a site would have the app on their phone or they could choose to have the app on their phone. It would allow them, um, if they press on it and maintain holding it down um, for the 30 seconds, um, they would be able to automatically call um, 911, um, fire and medical. Um, it also allows for geofencing. Um, so some of us really know what that is because of footsteps to brilliance. But basically what it does is um, once we establish that geofencing, let's say that I'm in E21, um, once I'm, when I'm pressing it down, um, it will send the signal directly to dispatch and it will identify, it will tell them that I am in E21 with the, uh, with the geofencing. Um, um, District-wide, if we chose to use that safety app, a five-year um, plan would be $158,000, um, $557.50. Um, and that would allow um, staff to also receive those messages. So let's say that we go on lockdown and there's an active shooter. Um, we are able to um, not only in one button send that to... Um, send that to 911, but we're also able to send that to staff and any district staff that also should be aware of it. So currently, if, um, if a site calls 911, the district is alerted through a log. Um, this would be even faster than that because we would know um, right away to our phones um, versus it going um, to, a, to an executive assistant that then has to then tell us. Um, so we think that this would be an excellent way um, to ensure that um, staff was up to date and also be able to um, quickly um, receive all those um, first responders. Um, the last thing that we are suggesting in terms of safety measures is an independent evaluation of Aptos High School event. Um, so we want to make sure um, that we do our part in really understanding what occurred before, during, and after the event. Um, so that we can uh, make changes and improvements um, to systems to ensure um, that we can try to prevent this type of tragedy in the future and also improve overall school safety. And so um, this is an estimate. It could be less, but um, we're assuming it would cost about um, $30,000 to have an expert come in and do an independent evaluation. Um, in a... Um, after public comment on this item, um, we will be asking the board to do a formal vote on the SRO as they took out the, um, the SROs out of the schools indefinitely. It is, um, it would, it's a requirement for us to have um, the official vote on that. Uh, there are three options that staff is, is recommending. And so you will see it um, if you, um, in the next, when the next action item occurs or the first action item occurs, if you are voting yes, um, that would be delineating that you are um, that you are wanting to move forward with option one. Option one is not actually as going back to what what we did previously in 1819. It's us looking at what the research is saying, us looking at what our community is saying and engaging in a pilot where we would pair an SRO um, with a mental health clinician. Doesn't mean that they would be in separate areas, but that they would be partners um, and that they would um, help to ensure that we can do what we had, to, what was in the research, which is change the context and the mindset of um, the SROs within the schools that it becomes a prevention upstream um, support um, in terms of safety. Um, we are recommending a pilot um, because um, it, is, it is being done in, in, in many cities, um, but um, we wanna make sure that it works within our context um, and we're suggesting it at two schools um, that our suggestion at this point is at Aptos High and Watsonville High. 
Um, we did not select PBHS because they currently are part of the success program that you just heard about. Um, and so we would be doing um, those two schools and, in, and helping to, um, um, to evaluate it and then determine at the end of the year um, if the pairing actually um, was supportive of, of the goals that we have. Um, the cost of that would be almost 1.2 million. Um, ongoing cost is what um, we would have to absorb eventually into the general fund. So currently we would be able to use one-time funding. We, would n we are not proposing any reductions of, mental, of any social, emotional, or mental health supports in order to fund this. So I want to, to make that um, apparent to everyone is we're, we're, this would be over and above what we currently have. It would not cause us to reduce anything. Um, what it would re require us is we would have to, by 2024, we would have to find within the budget the 823,000, either through COLA or other additional funding that we receive, we would have to fold that in. Um, but for the first three years, we would be able to use our ESSER funding, which is our one-time funding that we're receiving from um, the, well, it comes from the state, but eventually from the federal government. One-time cost is a 373,557. I do want to note that option one includes all of the safety measures that we noted on slides 31 and 32 as well. So it includes um, the geofencing app and includes the cameras and includes the um, campus supervisors. If you vote no um, to SROs on campus, then the staff recommendations are one of two things. Um, option two would to be to as our students had said, as, as many of the research has said, we would add additional mental health clinicians on top of what we already have. Um, so we would add one additional mental health clinician. Um, that cost would be um, almost 1.1 million. Um, 715,000 would be ongoing and 373,000, um, the same as all, because it's um, the hard one-time cost. Um, would be for the one time. And then the third option um, would be to, um, if the board selected, would be to only do the safety recommendations that are on slides 31 and 32. And um, that would be a cost of 577,257 um, ongoing, would be just the cost of the campus supervisors, which is a 203,700. Um, and then the ongoing, the one-time cost would be um, the other measures. Um, and so um, we will, um, we can take this down, but we will put this back up um, when it is time to do the vote so that um, you are also aware. Um, and we will um, stop the presentation at this point. Thank you. Um, are there any public speakers to this item? Yeah. So I'm gonna call um, you up three names at a time to take your turn speaking. At one minute, 30 seconds, I will let you know that there's 30 seconds left. You each have two minutes to speak. And this is just a reminder that comment cards need to come in before we start commenting or I'm sorry, before we start our proceedings on the topic. So right now we're at topic 5.1, we'll be hearing public comment for. So the first person, Daisy Brooks, Crystal Salcedo, and Gina Castaneda. Vice Coach Trustee um, Shocker, could you tell us how many speakers you have on this item, please? There's approximately 65 total. Thank you, for 5.1. So for 5.1? Go ahead. Good evening, Board of Trustees. My name is Daisy Brooks, and I am speaking to you this evening not only as a classified employee, but as a concerned parent. SROs are for the benefit and safety of students. Why wouldn't we want the safest environment for our children in our school system? These SRO officers are specially trained in handling youth, especially those who have experienced trauma. This is our opportunity as a community and school district 
to work together with our local law enforcement to create a safe environment for our students. There are a lot of activities going on in our schools that are not all reported. At the middle school I work, at, there have been multiple fights on and off campus within the first week of school, all recorded by students and posted on social media. We have children who are bringing drug paraphernalia, knives, vape pens to school. I've had my own children tell me that kids are bringing in drugs and vape pens and smoking them in bathrooms, cafeteria, and even classrooms. A 17-year-old student was stabbed and killed while attending school by two other students. A 13-year-old student the very next day was arrested for brandishing a knife on another student while on campus. I was, uh, in addition, we also need more training for our classified and certificated staff on school emergencies and planning. We as a district are not fully prepared for the possibilities. So with all that being said, I'm encouraging you, the trustees, uh, to make the right decision when it comes to the safety and well-being of our children in this district. These children deserve a safe environment to learn in. Thank you for your time. Good evening, my name is Crystal Salcido. My request this evening is for the board to reject the options given by the district and to immediately reinstate the school resource officers at each and every campus. And as I have stated in the data presented by Dr. Rodriguez this evening, what is missing is the application of that data to our actual community, to PVUSD. What's missing from the data is the pairing of how many actual students have been arrested and actually traveled to the juvenile hall from campus over the last three years. And that number is three students. Only three students have been transported to Juvenile Hall from campus over the last three years. And wh where is the data on the Caminos program at Watsonville Police Department? There are so many uh, ways in which this school district can partner and wants to partner with its police. And they are willing to be not only a restorative justice partner, but also work on exclusionary practices, which the SROs are in no way in charge of. That's the district's responsibility to work on exclusionary practices. But our police have absolutely been dedicated to restorative justice. And where is the communication with probation? And where is the communication with Watsonville police? Because they have said over and over again, we are dedicated. They made the Caminos program in Watsonville literally to wrap around juvenile at-risk youth and to completely divert them from the juvenile justice system. Our police want to be partners with you, but you have to let them in. Finally, you yourselves were protected on campus during a police football game. Time. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Gina Castaneda and I stand here, I coach several soccer teams in the community. These young men are going to stand here because they don't want to speak but um, have the same kind of opinion that I have. I want to say in the past few months um, since the SROs have been taken out, I want to say I can't believe it. I can't believe that anybody would say that Watsonville PD or any law enforcement would in incarcerate youth because that's the only thing that they want to do. There's been so much work and so much collaboration with law enforcement, probation, the schools, and nonprofits, just like the one that you talked about, the SSP program. When I had worked for a local nonprofit, I saw firsthand the compassion, empathy, comfort, support, and police gave youth and their families. They treated them with respect, and they helped the victims. I think that's where we have lost the victim's look voice. Culturally, I will tell you, in our community, we have failed because we parents tell kids all the time, portate bien o le vamos a hablar a la policía. We have instilled fear in our own kids by using the police to parent our children. Kids that live in their homes 
where gangs, domestic violence, and other violence, they are schooled down or taught by people that are victimizing them, not to trust in police, probation, counselors, or teachers. These kids, because I know, because I was one of them, did not trust and did not come forward to get the support that I needed to be able to become the person that I am today. Victims, schools are a place where people can be safe. I would like to see the Caminos data. You talked about juvenile probation. Where are they? They're the experts. They touch social emotional, social aspects, positive um, social activity, law enforcement, and change. They are, Santa Cruz County is one out of four departments in the nation that is changing the way that it works with law enforcement, schools, and communities. You talked about data. I want to see what restorative, poli you Correct. talked about restorative practices. Okay, next speakers, April Hernandez, Mirella Gonzalez, and Bobby, sorry, Marshall. Come on up. Good evening, thank you. My name is Mireya and I am a parent with PVUSD and I can just tell you that in all the history of an SRO being on a campus, there has never been a death for our school. Okay, this is the first time that we've had a situation like this because there is no authority, no SROs on our campuses. Also, I had done some research and I went onto the Santa Cruz County Probation website. And if you look at the data, the Santa Cruz County shows that the juvenile hall has had the lowest rates of incarcerated use in its history. This is due to the collaboration of police, nonprofits, and probation. Since removing the SROs, the number has doubled. Okay? Yeah. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm April Hernandez. I'm a parent of two children that attend PVUSD. However, they are only in middle, I mean elementary school. It still just saddens me to hear this. They were on the road to go to middle school at Aptos Junior and then go to Aptos High. And now I really wonder if that's the right decision to make as a parent when I hear about this. I feel like this was a tragedy that could have been prevented. There were eight, fights on campus and in the two first weeks of school and I hear that only two were reported. If an SRO had been on campus, I really feel like that would have been different and something would have happened, action would have taken place. Mental health is very important to have as well, but what did they do in the situations? Were they notified about the fights on campus? Were those children seeking help? I think that in that instance, SRO would have made a bigger impact and a bigger difference and been able to report these fights and hopefully not let it get to the point that it did. Thank you, sorry. Okay. Hi there. Uh, thanks for your time. Uh, my name is Bobby Marchasalt. I'm a resident of Watsonville. In addition to being a minister, I am a teacher in PVUSD, as is my wife. We have a student at Watsonville High, as well as a middle schooler and an elementary schooler all at PVUSD. My heart goes out, first of all, to all the youth and families involved with and affected by the recent violence at Aptos High and in our communities. I do appreciate, Dr. Rodriguez, uh, your effort to include a social emotional aspect to the SROs if it were to come back. Uh, I recognize that and say thank you. However, I will be uh, the first one tonight to uh, be a voice to ask that you not bring SROs back on campus. Um, I just want to encourage you not to make a knee-jerk reaction uh, to the recent events. Policing campuses is not the answer to creating a healthy and safe environment at our schools. 
and especially without a more robust conversation than what we have had been able to have in the last week or two's time. As a member of Watsonville's Ad Hoc Committee on Policing and Social Equity, I have had the opportunity this past year to get to know our police department well, and I have a great deal of respect for them. These concerns are not a sweeping indictment of police due to a woke ideology, as has been suggested by some. The decision to remove cops from our campuses was made as a result of thorough research and listening, and while it is true we find ourselves in a very different place a year and a half later, the decades, in fact, much more of history that led to that decision that leads many of our most vulnerable students feeling less safe have not gone away. In fact, many have been exacerbated. Let's continue to invest in social emotional supports. Let's bring more counselors, as the option two suggested, for students who have missed a year and a half of that support. Let's partner with nonprofits and individuals who can work on our campuses with at-risk youth, provide intervention, invest in cell towers and cameras, okay. I am not in support of bringing back SRLs in any of our campuses, but also is it a one-size-fits-all? Can we look at the different communities and are all of our schools have the same perspective? Will all of our Hi. communities feel the same way? Thank you. Next three, Aisha Carroll, Val Vigil, and Marsha Delfino. Sorry, Maria. Hi, my name is Aisha Carroll. I have a son, first time at Aptos High School. I have also, um, in my profession, I deal with most of the um, populations that all of this is talking about. You can find data on both sides that is valid and current that will support either SRO or not SRO. Jennifer and I have both worked at an institution in the past together where people that worked there were being assaulted and our lives and the lives of others were put in jeopardy. We did not ask for counseling. We have counseling. We asked for immediate security and to help people be protected from violent acts. That is what I am asking of you today. You are responsible, and we're adults asking for this for ourselves. I deal with youth, I deal with teens, I deal with gang members, cops, all of it. My son is attending. You guys are responsible for my child while well, he is at your school. You have active gang members, you have students with weapons, you have students with violent criminal history. If you are going to accept, as we should, everybody, then you need to make the community safe while, you're, while my child is in your care. So despite the fact that you have the counseling and all the stuff you've talked about, a poor young man was stabbed to death and died at the school campus. Every time my son walks past that, he thinks about that boy who lost his life. Talk about needing counseling, okay? This is a situation not about fear. This is about a child that cannot be brought back. And we need to prevent that from happening again. Hi, members of the board. My name is Val, and I'm speaking to you as both a mother of a current freshman at Aptos High and also as a local emergency department physician and one that was lucky or unlucky enough to be involved in the tragedy. Um, I do want you to know a couple things. Um, I do think that some type of security would be useful on campus. I, you've presented lots of different options, and quite frankly, I think mental health is truly necessary as well, and combining the two seems like an excellent approach. I think the idea of a, a resource officer of any type on campus in a punitive fashion, however, is a horrible idea. So this would be just a resource officer to keep our kids safe. My understanding about the event is that there was at least one perpetrator who was not a student at our school. 
And my question to you is, how, how did they get on campus? How did they get on campus? Why didn't anyone know where this kid was? Why did he have to walk so far to get help? And then I do want you to know um, that I appreciate everything that the school has done and the school board coming to meet. Um, efforts were truly hampered uh, by lack of cell phone service, so I'm very happy to see that being noted and addressed. Um, and I just want to take a minute to recognize Gerardo because it was a horrible loss. Please protect our students. Thank you. Hello, my name is Maria and I'm a former Aptos High School alumni. I graduated in 2015. Um, I remember my year there were three students who committed suicide and after the first suicide you guys acknowledged it by bringing in a lot of counselors and there were still two more suicides. And so I see the importance of having counselors. I know that was something that I'm sure brought a lot of the counselors in, but that shouldn't mean taking a safety officer out. Um, my experience with the safety officer is he was a younger gentleman, probably in his mid thirties, who everyone saw of as like a respected person that they would go talk to. I mean, I don't think that there was any fear that I was aware of. He was another advocate for students who would you know, go up and talk to him during breaks and lunch, and it wasn't a punitive thing. And it was a great way for young people to learn how to speak with police officers and how to have a respectful connection with them because they are members of our community who we need to know how to learn to talk to and what better place to learn how to be respectful and to be respected than on a school campus. Next speakers, Teresa Delfino, Brandon Diaz, and Reverend Beverly Brook. Hello, I have been a parent of a child at Pajaro Valley Schools for 27 years. I have seen a lot in this school district. When the school resource officers first came on campus, it was unusual, but over the years, I have come to really appreciate it. Uh, there has been an instance where I was called into school, and I met with the vice principal, and I was given the matrix. This is what your child did, and this is the punishment. There was no discussion, no... Um, no, no, anything, but this is the consequences of what your son did. I was so upset that I went, I was going to go to the police, and I thought, well, let me check in with the school resource office first. And he calmed me down, he listened to what I had to say, he educated me, he was a liaison, he, he got to really educate me and make me feel comfortable and safe that my child would be protected at school. I think it is of the utmost importance that they be at school. I agree that counseling is a good idea, but often people who need counseling the most don't seek it. The officer, the officer on campus can come and mitigate and it is aware. And I'd like to know how many, I was surprised when I found out that there are kids on probation at the school. Call me naive, I didn't realize that. When I was in school, they went to other schools. They called it continuation school. I think that there should be, I don't know what the ratio is, but I would like to see maybe one SRO for every 10 formal parole students. I, I think that would be a good idea. All right. Um, well, greetings. Uh, my name is Brandon Denise, and I'm an educator at Lakeview Middle School, and this is my seventh year in the district. I would like to extend my thanks to the board for letting me speak today, and I would like to express my sympathies for all those impacted by violence in our schools. Just yesterday at my site, we had a shelter in place and none of our staff had had a training for this in over two years. 
I understand that many of us are here to talk about school resource officers, and I feel this focus is misguided based on the reality of the contextual features causing our schools to be unsafe. I would like to speak on behalf of our Watsonville families and students, particularly those at the middle and elementary schools. I hope that the board will not make a rash decision tonight based on fear and politics. I feel sad that the sheriff, at every given media opportunity, continues to perpetuate the myth that school resource officers keep our schools safe. And his choice to politicize this tragedy, shame. School resource officers fuel bloated budgets, student anxiety, the military and police industrial complex, and the school to prison pipeline. The day after the Aptos tragedy, a student in one of our middle schools was detained for brandishing a knife and attempting to stab a peer. This incident was not even communicated to the staff until the end of the school day. What are we doing to keep our middle schools safe? Because reinstating SROs won't make a difference for our middle school or our elementary school students. The choice to reinstate SROs would be short-sighted and a decision based on fear and political pressure. We should be investing in our students and families by investing in people and not the police. We need a sustainable structure of campus security, counselors, and mental health clinicians. Instead of reinstating SROs, we should be filling the close to 50 vacant teaching jobs and putting the staffing in place to ensure that our students are safe at every level. Teachers and students currently do not feel safe and supported. We do not have adequate staffing in place to support safe schools, and bringing SROs back into our high schools will do absolutely nothing to change that. We need to change the context and how we establish school safety because student resource officers are not the answer. Good evening and thank you for taking the time to listen to the community's concerns and desires. My name is Reverend Beverly Brook. I am a pastor with Peace United Church of Christ. I serve as a chaplain at the Santa Cruz Juvenile Hall and the county jail. A month or so ago, a young man in Juvenile Hall and I were talking when he started crying and he said, I knew I would end up here. I just didn't think it would be this soon. What the 16-year-old meant by here was his facing serious charges and potentially numerous years of incarceration. I thought, what is wrong with this picture? Why would a 16-year-old know he was going to end up here? In the past five weeks, our community has experienced the loss of six young men of color through acts of violence, two deaths and four looking at years of incarceration. These tragic losses are providing our community with the opportunity to rethink our priorities and demand that we do better. Research shows that youth experience five separate incidents of trauma prior to getting into enough trouble to land them in juvenile hall. Trauma such as racism, poverty, immigration, unemployment, food insecurity, <laughs> homelessness, and the pandemic. How we address these traumas how we hold that pain and work with it, how we turn the power of suffering toward healing is crucial because violence is what happens when we don't know what else to do with our suffering and our pain. Guns, knives, violence provides our youth with a sense of agency. I appreciate that the easy answer to the recent violence is to put an officer back on campus providing us with a perceived sense of safety. But this is a Band-Aid approach to a complicated issue. This is not a law enforcement problem, nor is it really a school district problem. It is our collective community's problem, and we must do better. We have to provide mental health resources, employment opportunities, expand recreation. we're at time. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Oh, all right. And I just want to add one thing. We pay $320,000 per youth per year at Juvenile Hall. We can do better. Okay, next speakers, Brady, sorry I can't make out your last name, Tiffany and Colleen.
My name is Tiffany Chapman. I'm the mother of four PVUSD students, two currently at Aptos High. I have been a part of this school district for 14 years, and by the time my youngest graduates, I will be 20. I'm here today to ask you to do the right moral thing and bring SROs back on campus. I have watched the last several board meetings and I'm appalled at your backpedaling and excuses, constantly trying to defend your decision to get rid of SROs on campus. I have a huge problem with your statistics, stating that the mental health of PVUSD students has gotten better over the last two years as a direct result of hiring more counselors. How could your data be correct, given the fact that you didn't even have students on campus for most of that time? While the sheriff's data, every article, and every article I've read state that anxiety, depression, domestic violence, and child abuse are on the rise, which directly correlates to the rise in violence we see on our school campuses. I am happy about the increase in mental health available to our children, but it cannot be at the expense of their safety. In an, act in an article written by Outlook Santa Cruz, Dr. Rodriguez stated that she doesn't necessarily believe a security officer would have helped in this specific incident. This was just hours after the murder of a student, and your initial response was to defend your bad decision without any facts to back it up. Shame on you. I honestly believe it was Dr. Rodriguez and the board's negligence that led to this young man's death. Sheriff Hart stated that if an SRO had been on campus, the perpetrator, who was already on probation, would have been pulled off campus after his first fight and would have been dealt with through the probation office. Your inability to respond to the increasing violence on our school grounds should result in all of you losing your jobs. It was your negligence that directly contributed to the murder that took place on school grounds during school hours. We all know PVOSD is going to be sued and held liable for the death of this young man. And this is why you continue to defend your bad decisions instead of focusing on the safety of our children. I, along with many other PVUSD parents, time. demand that you return SROs to our campuses. Good evening. I'm the... It's on. Excuse me. Please do not shout. She has her mask on. Thank you. Okay? I will She's tighten. adjusting it. We, I will tighten it, but we I don't that. ask you to please be respectful Thank to you. everyone so everyone has a chance to speak. Thank okay? You. We, we're watching. Okay? So please be respectful. Good evening. Thank you. Go ahead. I am the mother of a fantastic sophomore at Aptos High. I've been wondering, when the board severed ties with our campus police, did the board think that they would do a better job at protecting and serving than the police do? I don't think so. Now we have a murder in broad daylight and two parents who will never again hug their son. We've seen no evidence of remorse from this board. It is alarming that they are looking at our kids' vaccination records while ignoring their criminal records. One of the murderers had a record, and he would have been removed from campus had the sheriff been involved. No one needed to die. Right? Yes, we want campus police and law enforcement and SROs and every possible safety measure. We want it immediately, permanently, and without pause. We want it not only for our kids, but for our amazing teachers. They too are at risk. Protect them all. The pavement of Aptos High will forever be stained with the blood of that poor boy. It could have been my boy, your boy, your girl. To the members of this board, please show a modicum of integrity and please bring back SRO and law enforcement and safety. Your data is meaningless. And to the family of Geraldo, I am profoundly sorry for your loss. Let us honor his memory and do what we know to be right. Thank you. Okay. This is the last call for Brady, listed as a partner. Is there Brady here? Okay. Moving on, Chris Webb, Nikki Halstead, and Irene O'Connell. Uh, 
Um, I teach at Renaissance, which is composed predominantly of the vulnerable students, disproportionately likely to be targeted by SROs. The SRO from, that we have had at our school have been uh, from Sheriff Hart's department, and they've been largely AWOL when we did have that program. Um, since they've been gone, we've had no fights. We, we did have fights sometimes before. They, uh, it, them not being there was kind of a good thing because a lot of the students were not really feeling them and given the way they kind of function, it's made for the best. However, um, it means that the spending on SROs was not fiscally prudent. And Hart himself, when he's spoken about um, his service, he always neglected to mention Renaissance. Uh, based on the feedback from students and the lack of Renaissance's mental health clinician being available to serve Renaissance after the Aptos tragedy, clearly it seems to me that mental health support is where uh, we would be better poised to spend our money. I would also argue lack of supervision and school structure played a bigger role in allowing the violence on campus more than lack of SROs. Um, I think we should do more to develop students' coping skills and we should spare the $400,000 car ride that Renaissance used to get from the SRO, because that's all we got. Uh, if this district must regress, and then, then I think we should adopt a couple of contingencies, insist that SROs not be in full uniform with no visible gun, insist SROs actually be a part of the school community they serve um, and have implicit bias training, and finally, ensure that SROs be of the community they serve. Thank you. Hello, my name is Irene, and I'm speaking today on behalf of Food What. Food What is a youth empowerment and justice organization serving Santa Cruz County high school youth, most of them living in Watsonville. Together, we co-manage a farm and create space for young people to authentically express themselves. The recent incident at Aptos High, as well as other recent incidents of youth-involved violence in Watsonville, have greatly impacted our youth crew. Yesterday, we asked the youth what they thought solutions to on-campus violence might be. We heard some stories about helpful counselors who made a big difference, but overwhelmingly, we heard a sense of hopelessness from the youth. A majority of youth shared that they feel violence on campus is inevitable. As an organization dedicated to the well-being and safety of young people in our community, this was very hard to hear. We asked our crew if they would feel safer with SROs on campus. Most of them said no. Some of them were unsure. Nobody said yes. But there were nuances in their responses. We asked if access to mental health resources was the solution. Most said yes, yet some were hesitant due to counterproductive experiences that they've had with school counselors. There was a range of opinions among our crew about what made them feel safe and what it would actually take to shift the culture of violence in our entire community. At this time of tragic loss and urgency to respond, we would like to encourage PBOSD leaders to pause, take the time to really listen to students right now. What we are hearing from youth is that there is complexity beyond the binary argument of SROs versus mental health counselors. To oversimplify the multi-layered and generational issues playing out in our community does not move us closer to understanding the problems at their root. We need a more intentional process of deeper listening and appro an approach that more profoundly invites students and families to the decision-making table. We ask you to please pause and consider the long-term consequences of having more law enforcement present on campus. More SROs on campus do not necessarily guarantee safety on campus, and they do not build the culture of empowerment and hope that youth need and want to feel right now. More police on campuses are a message to students that we do not trust them. Thank you. Bernard Gomez, Anthony, and Martha Victoria Vega. Hello, my name is. 
name is Anthony Flores. I was a former Watsonville High School um, student, class of 2020. And prior to graduating, I helped, me and my best friend Yvette Castillas helped create and carry the Wellness Center with um, our administration and Ms. Nunez. So if you guys have any questions about that, ask her. And essentially, the reason why we created the Wellness Center was to help bring resources like Monarch Services, PVPSA, and the Diversity Center and other services to help youth um, kind of get access to mental health services because that's especially needed right now, especially after the pandemic. And I want to point out something that police and SROs don't prevent crime. They come and um, kind of assist crime that's already committed. So, you know, they don't really uh, prevent anything because crime is always going to happen no matter what. And especially among their youth, I believe that mental health services are really needed and uh, more wellness centers because our youth sometimes have no idea that we have social emotional counselors in our school. As a matter of fact, I believe most of Watsonville High School had no idea until we created the wellness center. So we have all these wellness um, resources. They're not being applied to students and they're not being told to students and they have no idea. That is why we have the lack of mental health services um, being provided to students and that's why we have poor mental health amongst our students in the PVOSD. So, um, I know SROs are probably going to be um, implemented into our schools. So I ask that we also implement superv um, supervision, but like supervisors like you guys are talking about, um, because SROs bring a type of fear to people of color, especially here at Watsonville High School. Um, we've never felt safe with SROs at any point that I've been here in my four years. Um, at Alianza, they had supervision, but the supervision were adults from the community that looked like us and that were us. You know, there were Latinos who have been through the same thing as we do, so they're able to give perspective and um, help students in that way. So if you guys are going to bring supervision, I recommend they match what we look like and that they are from our, com are from our community. All right, time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, buenas tardes. Uh, so, you know, what I'm hearing is that the admi administration is, uh, is not doing their job and SROs are the answer. I mean, is that what I'm hearing? Anyways, I want to express my deep condolences to the families who have been impacted by this unfortunate tragedy, lateral violence, a tragedy that is all too familiar in the beautiful brown community of Watsonville and the surrounding areas. PBUSD cares, whole child, whole family, whole community. That is something that, is a, that is something that I want to be a part of and contribute to. But what I'm seeing at this very moment is what child, whose family, and what community. No one is ever prepared for a situation like this, and it must be difficult to, it must be a difficult task to navigate. But the moment the board and the superintendent allowed these forums to take place in the manner that they did, you created a segregated, politicized, and racialized conversation. <laughs> not, once, not once expressing the condol condolences to the families, not once addressing the bigotry and racism that was circulating, but rather highlighting a sheriff and WPD. Listening to Inaptos' affluent voice, while ignoring the actual community who has been affected by this uh, tragedy. But really, is policing our schools really the solution you want? Is this really your solution you want your legacy to be remembered by? I understand that people are under an emotional charge right now, but to revert back to failed practices and puni uh, failed punitive practices without giving process a chance is premature. The unintended consequences of bringing back police to campus will fall heavily on students of color. Those are facts. Uh, PBUSD is under duress for decades, schools underfunded, teachers underpaid, overworked with little help, We're students, at time. students social determinants of health are under direct stress also. We just need health, love, and care, you know what I'm saying? We don't need cops, girls. Okay, now we have a Kara Boggs. Oh, sorry. Good evening. My name is Marta Victoria Vega. I'm a Watsonville High School alumni. I live, work, 
in this community. And I'm here today to thank you for everyone on the board as well as the community, everybody that is speaking on both sides. I wish there was um, all the money in the world to be able to solve every single problem. As I stand here today, it's painful to see the room divided. Um, it's heartbreaking to know a child died in school. It's painful. In 2012 and 2013, as I hold this, I did a study, a local study. It's over 200 pages. I worked with students from Renaissance High School and our Pajaro Valley Unified School Board students. I did qualitative and quantitative data, both. I listened to the concerns of the students and I've heard your proposals that you have. I am for mental health, for social and emotional, but for school resource officers. I used to work in a different capacity where I was able to assist collecting evidence and going to autopsies. Those are images I will never erase from my mind. I care for our community and our students, and I hope you make the best decision to bring school resource officers to our community. Nellie Vakira Boggs, Greg Tucker, Travis Walker. Good evening. Um, I want to reference um, a couple items that were on the slides. You presented to the community um, the number of counselors that we have available um, throughout our district. I just want to remind our um, listeners that this is a very large school district and there are, as per the 2021 LCAP to parents um, uh, presentation, just under 20,000 students that um, they uh, recorded for, for the community to, to see as public record. Anyways, 19 psychologists for 20,000 students across this district of 33 sites. Most of our psychologists are taxed with assessments. <clears throat> 23 high school counselors. So that would be at the various sites that we have at, in the district. And our counselors are working on scheduling, working with students, um, getting them ready to for, apply for college, planning their educational plan, and addressing their social emotional needs. But across the 34 sites, or 33 sites, there are 17 social emotional counselors for the district. And that means that there are sites that have to share a social emotional counselor. That's not somebody that's con constant every day to help build that connection when we're talking about the whole child and the whole co learning community. We wanna look for long-term goals, something that is sustainable, something that our students will also be able to grow from elementary through high school and benefit, so they benefit from counseling and understanding that the resource is there. So we would like to see there be a strong need for a emphasis on hiring more social emotional counselors, more mental health clinicians to help our students at our sites and to build those connections with our, with our students. Thank you. Hello, um, I'm Travis Walker. I'm a teacher here at Watsonville High School. Um, I teach history, and one of the main things that we are tasked with doing as teachers is teaching students how to use evidence. And as you've presented today, you know what the evidence says about SROs. There's no evidence that they're actually effective at bringing safety to campus. There is, however, plenty of evidence that shows 
that they do, while making some students feel safer, they make students who look like me and students who look like most of my students in Watsonville feel unsafe. I went to a school when I was in high school that had SROs, and I can tell you firsthand, I did not feel safe there. They harassed me and my friends. We were searched on campus for no reason. It happened several times throughout my experience there. I would please ask you, listen to the voice of your students. I had a conversation with my students today about how they felt about what the board was discussing today. There were some mixed reviews, most students didn't want to bring them back. Some did. What every single student nodded their heads to and what came up in every single one of my classes was students do not feel like they have access to mental health resources here on campus. They do not feel like they have access to their academic counselors or the socio-emotional counselors. They, in every class, they reported having to wait, having to make appointments, sometimes never getting that appointment after they've made it and actually being able to have the opportunity to speak with the professionals that they needed to speak to. If there's anything that needs to be done today, it's bringing more counselors onto campus. Thank you. Hi, good evening. I, I don't envy any of, your, any of your seats right now. This is a, this is a really tragic time. Um, but I, I will say that um, police officers do not belong on a school campus unless there's an emergency, unless there's an emergency situation, in which case they're called and they arrive. So fix the cellular reception spots, add more cameras, right? But most importantly, if we're truly about student safety and social emotional well-being, our comprehensive high schools need to increase the teaching staff to student ratio or even fill all the open positions. Students are smart. They quickly realize how any system perceives them. More teachers and smaller classes mean we as a district, as a community, value these young folks as individuals. Armed officers tell these students something very different. Gabriel Cox, Sarah Leonard, and Nikki Halstead. Good evening. Thank you for all of your energy and dedication to being here. Um, my name is Katie Gabriel Cox. I am a mom to four boys. My four boys are current, future, and past Aptos High students. I also work as a physician in this community. And I was driven to come here tonight because I work in Watsonville, but I am not from Watsonville. And it is so disheartening to me to see our school district and our community divided across socioeconomic lines and racial lines. Um, and you know, I had a bunch of notes and I just put them aside and I'm here to say that I want my children to experience a, cool, a school system that amplifies the voices of our families of color. Um, we're, those of us in this room are here because we're able to be here. We had a car to get here. We have childcare, we have jobs that don't allow us, that don't require us to work these hours. But I want my children to attend a school that listens to the voices of those families who are not here. And my concern is that adding more policing in our schools will only hurt those families and not help those families. Thank you. My name is Sarah and I'm here, I've been to board meetings many times, 
This is the most profound one by all, by far. I'm here as a concerned parent, a heartbroken educator, and a distraught community member. My son attends Aptos High, the site of Gerardo's tragic murder. Gerardo was in my fourth grade class eight years ago, and his brother was in my class three years ago. His family includes his two devoted parents, his older sister and his younger brother. The parents are raising their children to be kind and exemplary and responsible. These attributes shine through each of them, and it was a joy to be their teacher. I watched the press conference on Thursday, September 1st, and was struck by how heartless and mechanical some of it sounded. I attended the heart-wrenching memorial service last Wednesday with my friends and co-workers, teachers who, like me, are living with heavy hearts in the days after this nightmare began. <clears throat> I walked up to the front of the church and stumbled on my words, trying to console Gerardo's parents and his brother, who sat crumpled in the pew only feet away from the open casket where Gerardo lay. I walked down the hall to greet his sister, who has been a pillar of leadership in the face of impossible grief. Yesterday, my coworkers and I visited with his family at his home. As we walked in, we were overcome by a beautiful and agonizing altar for this young man that took up half of their living room. Potted flowers covered the floor with a decadent fragrance and framed photos of Gerardo with his feet in water and his head down, his eyes intent on the freedom and healing quality of that moment, were there. Portraits of Mother Mary adorned the space and hearkened back to the memorial service where we were given a beautiful card with her portrait and details of Gerardo's life. We offered support and gave the gift from our school and the card signed by our staff. We communed with his mom and sister as his younger brother took his young nephew out to play. When asked how the district and the high school and the junior high has reached out to the family and supported them, the answer was, we have not heard much from them. Reeling, the tears welled up and cascaded around our masks as the five of us sat in stunned silence. What could we possibly say? I am here tonight to implore the PVUSD community and the community at large to check our implicit bias, whatever they are, and shine with compassion like Gerardo shined throughout his 17 years. The leaders of PVUSD need to give freely, driven by the concept that this violent act could have been our child. Galvanized by the idea that parents send our children to school with the faith that it is a safe space, this murder has spotlighted the need for more supervision at Aptos High. Thank you the murder time. took place in the bus area and pickup area, and that is in the front of campus. There needs to be supervision in that area, in the quad where students enjoy their break. This supervision is crucial. My student's death has revealed the need for more compassion for a family that trusted their child would come home from school on August 31st, and instead they are grappling with a life sentence of suffering as parents who have had to bury their child. That's all the cards that came in at the start of the, um, the agenda item. All, all cards need to come in before the start of the agenda item, and we'll, um, we're going to need to move on to item 6.1. So, um, or excuse me, are there any questions or comments from the board? Um, so, uh, Trustee Soto? There are cards that were turned in after the item began. We still have cards for items 6.1 and 6.2 that many people have put in, and those items have not come up for discussion, so we'll still be calling people if they are for here for 6.1 and 6.2. Trustee Soto. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Test, test, thanks. Um, 
this whole situation is very, very, very unfortunate and should have never happened. The idea that a student got up in the morning, mom probably packed him a lunch, got on a bus or he was dropped off, thinking that he's gonna have a full day at school and this unfortunate situation happens. We don't know why. Could it have been prevented? Could it have not been prevented? The idea of not having an SRO on site is, I'll put it to you this way as an example. Being a former soldier, former police officer, I've made this statement before. Nobody understands public safety on this board more than I do. Now, if you're, if you're on the highway and you're passing a CHP on the side of the road and the zone is 55 and you're doing 70, what's your first reaction? You, you slow down, exactly. It's a deterrent. It stopped you. It made you think. Now, do you think that day had a sheriff been on site that somebody wouldn't have thought twice about doing something? So, like I said, it may or may not have been prevented, but it wouldn't have happened at Aptos High School that day. So, just food for thought. There's two sides to every story, and everybody has their feelings about how they feel about things. I'm going to ask the members of the public to please be respectful of the many different opinions and give people their opportunity to speak, and that you treat people the way that you would want to be treated when you were speaking. Thank you, President Holm. Now, we've got to remember, we live in the United States. We have freedoms. You can think how you th want to think, and I can think how I want to think. Trustee DeSerpa can think how she wants to think. She's free to do so. We're all free to do so. We need to respect that among each other. That's the problem today is nobody has any respect towards ideology, towards anything, towards religion, towards school, towards authority, nothing. That's gone out the window. That ideology has undermined our country as a whole, and it's our, in our backyard now. So we need, to, we need to think about that as we go into the future here. Thank you. Vice President Shocker. Thank you, President Holm. First off, I'd like to say that I am truly sorry that our community is experiencing the loss of a student. Losing a student through a tragedy, through a homicide, is not something that I ever thought I'd be sitting and dealing with and talking to the public with and sending sympathy to fam the family who has lost their son permanently. This is an experience that none of us ever thought we'd be sitting on this board having. I'm not having a knee-jerk reaction I'm having a reaction from reading hundreds of emails from concerned parents, from students, from community members who took the time to write their thoughts on both sides of the issue. What I have learned through their studies they have sent me, their thoughts, their experiences, is that we're a community divided. And if we're a community divided, it's going to get us nowhere. We sit at a different place. Yes, it's true. We sit at a different place than we were a year ago. We're still in a pandemic. Nobody thought kids would be out of school for 18 months. Nobody thought they'd be losing loved ones to a novel coronavirus. There's sorrow and fear in our school community. And when there's fear, it gives way to manifest to anger. And anger leads to division. The only way out of this vicious spiral of fear and anger is love, compassion, and empathy. I have read, I have thought, I have asked questions, but I am humble enough to realize how little I know. In the long run, fear and division is more destructive than any decision I sit here and make today. For me, I must choose empathy and compassion to all in my community, no matter what side of the table they sit on. I will listen and learn with an open mind, and I hope all of you will do the same. This mindset is the one that opens you to discovery, innovation, and wisdom. 
And I hope that this tragedy can draw this community together so that we can come and bring innovative solutions to the table to take care of our youth, to stop systematic racism, to keep our students safe on campus, to provide mental health resources for our students. And yes, it does come down to money sometimes, and that's a hard thing to say, but it's the truth and I'm not gonna lie about it. And what can we do to change that? We can write our legislatures and we can write our senators and ask them to fully fund mental health programs in schools, to fund living wages for our teachers, to fund so that our buildings can be repaired. Because we, as a board, these are the decisions that we have to make. These are the decisions that we, sometimes we have to choose a building repair over a counselor for our students. And we shouldn't have to be in that position. And the only way out of that position is if this community comes together and bands together and works together and brings in more programs for our youth. We had a center youth now closed in Watsonville. Where are those middle schoolers going to go? We need programs that support our youth after school so they're not turning to a gang for a family. So they're not going home to be abused. So they're not going home to situations that they're afraid they might not wake up tomorrow in. So we need the community's help to make these changes. And so I'm asking all of you to help make these changes and help move this community forward and heal everyone's broken hearts. Thank you. Do any other trustees have any questions or comments? I have a couple of questions. All right, Trustee Orozco. I just want to say that there, this is unlike a town hall, a school board meeting has pretty strict laws on how we conduct the meeting. So open comments from the floor won't be recognized. I'm sorry. If you want to put in a card, it comes in before the item starts. Trustee Orozco? Uh, President, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. President Trustee Holm, it, it may be a similar topic. Since we're not at 6.1, yeah. he could put in he a card. He could put it in for 6.1. Could you please address that? Yes, so if you, if, so the agenda, or sorry, excuse me, for 6.2, put, put in another card. Yeah. Yes, we will hear it before we vote. That was the question. Will we yeah. hear their public comment yes. before we vote? Yeah, so. We do ask that people follow the county and state guidelines, please. Trustee Orozco? Let's please uh, be respectful of one another. Okay. I'm asking everyone, members of the public, please, we've had, we're on to our public board comments. There are times at 6.1 and 6.2 for further comment. It is now time for board comments. President Trustee Holm, I would just like to remind you of the training we received back in the spring of 2019 regarding the Brown Act. And if you feel that a meeting is, as board president is going to be disorderly and we cannot conduct the district's business, you do have the power and the authority to shut the meeting down. 
So I'd like to make the public aware of that. If the unruliness continues, our board president does have the authority to shut this meeting down and close it. So please, everybody, everybody, we know there is a lot of a passion and a lot of emotion on this topic, but let's please not be disruly and be respectful and let's continue with the board meeting so our board president doesn't end up having to be forced to shut it down. So I have a couple questions uh, regarding tonight's presentation, Dr. Uh, Rodriguez. Um, the first one, and it's, and it's also uh, from listening to the public and some of the concerns that were brought up regarding um, having mental health be easily accessible to students and parents um, and how to better promote the services that will be offered through our wellness centers. So I wonder if you can just touch base on what the plan is moving forward uh, because as a parent, I'm also concerned about that, the lack of accessibility, not so much not having access to the resources, but making the public, our families and students aware of those services. So, so I would say that I, I don't really, it's not necessarily that what I'm hearing from students is that they are aware of it, but they don't have access to it because there's not enough quantity. So what I'm hearing from students is that they're trying to get access in a moment of crises and they're told that they have to make an appointment um, or they are told that they have to wait. Um, so I'm sure that there are some students that don't know of the services. I think it's actually the opposite problem um, that we don't have enough um, supply for the demand. So we don't have enough services um, for students to do it. Um, we are looking, of which we think will be helpful, we are looking for our wellness centers, our family engagement and wellness centers. They will be open um, from 12 to 8, and they will be open on Saturdays, um, which will allow um, families to be able to pr receive those supports at different times. Um, so I think that is important. We also are introducing a new system called NowPow, which will be a warm handoff between our staff and other services. Um, so right now we have a referral process, for example, for PVPSA, um, but it doesn't necessarily allow us to see. We know we made the referral, but it doesn't allow us to see if they actually went um, and how many times they were serviced. Um, so now PAL will allow us to do that as well. Um, the reason why we did the restorative start was because we knew that 11% of our students, over 2,000 of our students, said that they had no supports at all. And we knew that we weren't going to be able to support, um, if you lined up 2,000 students, um, you weren't going to be able to have the level of support that you needed. So we needed everyone in the um, in the organization to be able to do a piece of that, and that's part of multi-tiered systems of support, right? So you have an initial layer um, that then um, provides that, that support. Um, and so what I would say is, is we'll continue to message with students, but when I'm talking to students, they're not necessarily saying that they don't know about the services. They're saying that they don't have access to the services because there's too many waiting um, for those um, few individuals that are there. Um, and so as part of our wellness centers, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, and please elaborate if I'm right, um, we're working with different uh, community partners, correct? Yes, so we have um, three main community partners, or four main community partners that we're working with. So. That is PVPSA, Salud para la Gente, um, Collective Action Board, and Second Harvest Food Bank. Those are the four main um, organizations that we're working with. And I'm assuming those were selected based on the needs we were seeing in the community. And just also the strong partnership and their, ability, their current ability to support. So if you think of the Watsonville community, the Aptos community, most, um, but especially the Watsonville community, most families are in contact with at least one of those four mm -hmm. um, organizations. Great, and I'm assuming that through 
those organizations, they'll be doing their own outreach to parents and families within our community, whether they're at Aptos High School here in Watsonville, uh, to ensure that if they have a question or a need, that they know to where to go. Yeah. Who to ask so for it's help. a one-stop shop. The goal is to have a one-stop shop to where, because it was mentioned before, sometimes we don't even know what we don't know. We don't know what we need at times. Um, so eventually there will be three um, wellness centers. Um, so one, the first one will be at EA Hall, and then we'll choose a secondary um, Watsonville location, and then we, we, we will have a, a location in Aptos as well. Thank you for addressing that. The other uh, question I had in regards to the presentation is uh, addressing also uh, the, the need for, for addition supervision um, in our middle schools. And I'm wondering if there's a plan in place or if that would be something that would be discussed in the future. So we are having conversations regarding increasing um, campus supervisors um, for middle schools. Um, and um, really just more eyes um, around the campus. So we're looking at it from a data approach of um, first the schools that are having um, more incidents um, and then following through there. Okay, thank you. Those are all the questions I have at this point in time. Are there any other further comments from the board? I'll defer my comments till the next item. Um, all right, so we'll move on to item 6.1, uh, placement of school resource officers on PVUSD campuses. Report will be presented by Dr. Michelle Rodriguez. Yeah. So if you'd be able to put up the last slide of the PowerPoint, that would be great. Um, and so in um, July 2020, um, then the board um, did at that point um, make um, the determination that they would um, remove SROs from campus. So at this point, um, the board needs to um, make a recommendation to, of um, if they vote yes, then our staff recommendation, as I mentioned prior, would not be to just um, simply um, replace the SROs, but it would be to do a pairing. Um, and then if the vote no, um, it would be um, either option two or three. And, um, and then the, net, the following vote is in regards to um, the, some of the costs and the approval of the cost. Um, and so I will um, leave it to the board for discussion. Do we have any public speakers for item 6.1? Yes, we do, President Holm. Okay, so I'm gonna call speakers up. Same thing, you have two minutes. Elias Gonzalez, Gail Garcia, and Adriana Torres. Um, buenas noches, buenas tardes, uh, Dr. Rodriguez and School Board Trustees. First of all, let me take time to introduce myself. As mentioned, my name is Elias Gonzalez. I was with you on the conversation around police dogs in 2019. There was four of us at that point here. Um, I was also here for the conversation on SROs on July 2020th. A couple more people showed up. Today I'm realizing here that there's a bigger place in the reality that there is division in the space. It's quite apparent that the Aptos community and the Boston community see very differently. Um, I think the reality here, uh, secondly, I want to let you all know that I am a part of an organization that historically has been demonized and villainized for the work that we do in the community. This is common practice that we unfortunately deal with in many environments where folks that do not conform with the status quo are outcasted and targeted. The PVUSD is no exception. We have black and brown students that are being targeted. Most importantly, I'm a father of a current student and a graduate student from PVUSD that understands firsthand the needs of the community and especially those young people. I was one of those young people. I was impacted. I was expelled by this district. And the resources that were here were not sufficient then and are not sufficient now. I can tell you that <laughs> you all heard my daughter come in front of you and tell you that the system was not working. She unfortunately is not able to be here, but when she came to you, she told you it was totally embarrassing. 
we can do better. Schools not prison refers to reinvesting funds into our schools and not into a carceral state. We heard from teachers how the lack of funding impacts their teaching abilities. We've heard from students. We've heard the stories of staff bringing their own supplies to schools. Let's reimagine if we reinvest what we presently invest in one person in the California Department of Corrections. I believe it was mentioned that we currently spend about 340 something thousand dollars in the We're juvenile hall. PVUSD currently invests thirteen thousand dollars for students. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Gal Garcia, and I'm one of the I'm part of us, the program of Stecas. I'm a student here at Watsonville High, and um, my freshman year, there was um, some officers at, at the campus, and I, I felt safe. Um, I felt like I didn't have to worry about like anything happening to me or my my family. My my little brother is a elementary student right now, and I worry about him because you know I don't know what could happen to him. Uh, well, I actually play with two officers in the Stegas program. I don't. I'm not afraid of them because I know they won't do nothing to me. And actually, Officer Officer Castillo is here. Um, he he motivates me to to do better in school and have have good grades and everything. Um, when what else? I, I felt safe when when I was at. I didn't let. Now I'm a junior and I don't feel safe because there's no. Cobbs in campus. Um, uh, I think that's it. Thank you. Hello, my name is Adriana Torres, and I'm a former Aptos High student. When I was at Aptos, I saw, I saw a lot. I saw fights. I saw fights in the shady trails, behind the library by in the bathrooms. I saw drug deals. I learned what heroin, cocaine, and prescription p pills were at Aptos High. I saw a lot of sexual assault. And I'm not gonna go further into that because it can, it can be triggering for a lot of people. During that time, we had cops on campus. So where were they? How were they going to heal and help the students? Did you know that most cops don't have degrees or SROs? They don't have bachelor's, master's, or PhDs. A lot of people in the community like myself have gotten master's, PhDs, bachelor's. We're here because we wanna help the students. We need social workers. We need counselors. We need therapists, psychiatrists. We need to start at the root of the problem before it gets worse. <clears throat> My last message is for Jim Hart. I have a master's in Chicana Chicano studies and I'm gonna get a doctorate pretty soon so it's gonna be Dr. Torres. So I've done the research, I've analyzed the data, I've read the books, I've read the articles, the school to prison pipeline, it's real in its inner community. So just because it doesn't affect you does not mean it's not real. Thank you. Buenas noches. Necesito un traductor. Go ahead and speak. Okay. Uh, soy Isabel García, uh, soy madre de tres niños, uh, una ya pasó por Aptos High School, la otra ahorita está en Aptos High School. My name is Isabel García, I'm the mother of three kids, one already went through high, uh, Aptos High and one is about to join Aptos High. Uh, he representado por casi 15 años, he ido al, a las juntas del distrito. For about 15 years I've gone to uh, district meetings. Eh, hemos pedido en, en cada año que por favor pongan más consejeros que, sean, que estén preparados. Every year we ask to please 
hire more counselors who are prepared. Uh, porque tuve una muy mala experiencia en Aptos High School de mi hija la mayor. Su consejera, que ahora es también de mi hijo, le pidió un consejo para que cómo podía ir a la universidad y la consejera le dijo que cuánta puntuación tenía y le dijo mi hija la puntuación que tenía y le dijo, no te preocupes, con esa puntuación tú puedes ir a Cabrillo. Entonces, I had a, a negative experience with a counselor of my daughter when, um, when she asked, where would you like, what is the, when my daughter asked her, how can I get to college? And she, uh, the counselor said, what is your grade point average? And she said, they said, don't worry about that. With that GPA, you can go to Cabrillo College. She is now counseling my son too. Ahora esa consejera le tocó a mi hijo. No quiero pasar por esa experiencia. And I don't want to go through that experience with my son again. Mi hija, la mayor, la que les acabo de informar, pasó por muchas cosas en Aptos High School. And hace cinco años también hubo más muertes ahí en Hub School. My daughter, the one I was just talking about, she went through a lot of things at Aptos High School. Five years ago, there were also deaths there. Por un arma muy poderosa que no se ha hablado aquí, por el bully. Due to a very strong weapon that you haven't discussed here, bullying. Por esa causa murieron como cuatro muchachos. Due to that, there were about four deaths. En la oficina, cuando van las madres y se quejan de lo que está pasando del bullying, en la oficina les dicen que allí no pasa nada. When parents go and complain to the office, they are told that nothing happens there. Ese es un problema muy grave para los est estudiantes que queremos que alguien les ayude emocionalmente. This is a huge problem for our students. We really want someone to help them emotionally. Esa es mi petición, que, que pongan, que ayuden a los estudiantes emocionalmente para que ellos no sufran todas esas cosas y ellos mismos peleen. That is my request to please, I'm sorry. To, uh, to increase counseling services so that students don't suffer that much anymore. Gracias. Thank you. Okay, Rocio Camagro. Sorry if I mispronounced your name. Ernesto Murillo and Edgar Ibera. Move this. Can you hear me? <laughs> sure. uh, good evening, board and community. My name is Rocio Camargo. I'm here as an alumni, constituent, parent, and classified worker. Parent of a senior at Aptos High who, pre who had a class with Gerardo that morning. So if there's anybody that's close to it, I am definitely there. I'm here because I get it. I get why parents and why the community right away started looking for a reason. How? How did this happen? Why? Why did they, this happen? And we try to figure that out because we want to prevent it. Right away we go to, is this gang related? Is it gang related? Because if you say it's gang related, then if I raise my kid right, my kid's okay. It's not going to be my kid. And so you look for that. Then you find out it's not gang related. Okay, so then the reason I, it was really frustrating for me as a parent to have to talk to my kid about this and have this be politicized to a talk about SROs. There is absolutely no way that I believe that an SRO really would have prevented this from happening. We went to these schools. We know that people that really want to do bad find a way to do it. If they don't do it on campus, they ask you to go to the pit. They ask you to go somewhere else in the community. They find a shady tree. We all know it. We're alumni. So what you're saying is, it's okay if it happens in the community, but not in this school. And evermore, if there was an SRO campus, how do we know there's no federal fund, there's no federal guidelines to their training? How do we know we wouldn't have had three fatalities instead of one? 
And we're also ignoring everything else that's going on in the world besides the traumatic experiences of a pandemic, the intergenerational trauma that is passed right, down fine. to these communities. The SROs are not the answer. Buenas noches, mi nombre es Edgar Ernesto Ibarra Gutierrez. Uh, I'm with Milpa, and it's obvious and apparent that, you know, not everybody lives the same experiences in life. That's just the reality. For me, I grew up with, one, with my mom, my three brothers and sisters. Four of us, poor, navigated all schools from Hall all the way to Calabasas, right? And, uh, you know, we were poor, we were homeless. Sometimes teachers were freaking, I was in elementary and they would give me detention because I was late to class. They didn't know how to walk all the way from Rodriguez Street to go to Ansoldo, you know? They didn't know all that, but at the same time, we, it's unfortunate what happened to Gerardo. He passed away, and that's something that reverberates throughout the community. Everybody feels it. But I lost friends that went to this school too, to violence, suicide, drug overdose, and to prison. Lost, lost them all. They all came to these schools. Where was the help for them? Where was the outcry from these white affluent folks here? You know, in that talk, there was no white because we were brown kids from Watsonville that nobody cared for. So I'm asking y'all to really care for us and think of saying no on SROs, say no on that, fight for us. Invest is gonna take a cultural shift. This is not a band-aid thing, it's a cultural shift. We have to go in there, dig out the roots, and plant something new and beautiful. There's gotta be something that's grounded in compassion, love, beauty. You know, platica, my mom always says, platicando se arreglan las cosas. By talking, we can fix things. Let's fix it up, let's fix it up. You know, you said, you know, everybody has different experiences and different perspectives, hell yeah. I've had my house barged in, had my cousins taken out. Shit, the police were the cuckoo to me. You know, that was the reality, but at the end of the day, everybody has different experiences. And I get that, but we just gotta figure this out. SROs are not the answer. Point blank, it's not the answer. We gotta go back, plant some new seeds, and let's watch, it's a whole new generation coming up. Whole new generation, what are we gonna do? Everybody's looking, everybody's looking, not just at y'all, but at all of us and how we act. Sometimes we don't have access to healthcare. This young man over here has access to healthcare and he doesn't care about our families. Just putting that out there too. Bernard Gomez, Hector Calderon, and Anthony. Hello. Um, I would just like to speak on the situation that happened at Aptos and what happened to Gerardo was like, it's really, really unfortunate, and it, just like everyone said, it really did impact the community, and um, I believe that the community, even right now, is still trying to come together, and I do hope that at the end of this that we could find a solution, um, and if anything, a compromise to figure out how we can go in the future. Um, I do not think SROs, I just wanna like reiterate this, I do not believe SROs are gonna be the final fix. Um, we're gonna have to do more than simply SROs and I also believe that it's gonna take implementing curriculum and education about mental health and services in our health classes. It doesn't just, it can't just be sex ed and what we eat. It has to be what is in our brains and what goes through them and the chemical changes that happen when we experience trauma and things like that. There's real biology and facts about all of this and we cannot continue to ignore it like previous generations have. If we continue to ignore it, we might as well expect this thing to continuously happen and no change to ever happen. Police are not social counselors, they're not scientists. Just like someone just said, a lot of them aren't even educated, don't even have college degrees. How are we gonna expect them to be the saviors of our children. The true saviors are gonna be the teachers and the counselors and the people who come together to invest in their students and their well-being. And hiring teachers who care about their students as well will help along with that. Thank you for your guys' time. I hope everyone has a wonderful night.
Once again, buenas tardes, good evening. Uh, so I guess I'm gonna pick up where I left off. Uh, uh, so I wanna start, so I, under I understand people are under an emotional charge right now, uh, but to revert back to failed practices uh, without giving process a chance is premature. Uh, the unintended consequences of bringing back police to campus will fall heavily on students of color. Those are facts. Uh, the superintendent just presented some data. You know that uh, SROs disproportionately target black and brown bodies. Uh, but the process which I'm talking about here is the decision to invest in the health infrastructure for our students and their success. It will take time to build adequate support for students, for teachers, for administrators, for all those involved. It will take time to address the traumas our schools have experienced. It will take time to heal. PBUSD has been under duress for decades. Schools underfunded, teachers underpaid, overworked with little to no help. Students' social determinants of health under direct stress. Now more than ever, we need to invest in positive youth student development with a continuum of care that extends to their families and the community. We need culturally relevant solutions, a healing informed process, a practice inclusive of all students. We must address the root causes with the community partnership with love, care, understanding, and open dialogue. If PBUSD cares, if PBUSD CARES message is true, then this board will reject this emotionally charged, nearsighted status quo SRO element and provide true, true leadership that will impact our students' upward mobility, safety, and success. Support student healing, not SRO surveillance. Thank you. Yeah, hi, good evening. <clears throat> My name is Hector Calderon, and I'm here tonight because there will be a decision being made in terms of um, having SROs on campuses. And as we know, um, you know, SROs' presence, um, knowing well that despite the general um, acceptance belief that stationing police on schools' campuses makes schools safer, um, when in reality, the practice um, really harms many students, um, as well as, you know, the schools in, in itself that, um, you know, promote this sort of idea. Um, you know, I just wanted to say that, yeah, instead we should be investing that money in school-based um, mental, mental uh, health resources and other supportive services um, because our, you know, brown and black folks in these, in these communities deserve resources that expand and improve um, our students by having counseling services that allow um, them to have the space where one can learn to heal because schools are a place to learn and to grow, right? Not a place where the presence of a police uh, makes them feel uncomfortable and feel like they're being, uh, you know, looked at and that if at any moment they've done something wrong, that the smallest mistake will bring them some sort of trouble. So let us reimagine the safety without police and reinvest in positive supports that actually help our students. And so by voting no on having SROs, whether there is a mental health clinician, um, I think that we really need to consider having more uh, services for our students so that they are able to um, you know, take those services in a way that will allow our community to heal. Thank you. Okay, next speakers, Jermaine, Stephanie, and Francis Salgado. Thank you. 
Oh, am I ready? Okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, I want to say that my heart's broken for the family. I definitely feel that a lot of the concerns that were brought up are valid. And I'm especially concerned with the first accounts of people that were going to Optas High School regarding the different incidents that they experienced. I remember two of the suicides back, I forgot how many years ago, and I feel like SROs do not make any kind of difference. Um, I also wonder what parents that were here, if they were there for the family. And from what I heard earlier, they were not. So I definitely feel there needs to be more support for the family of this victim, which is Gerardo, because my mind is always there with him. I was, so in 2012, my best friend's brother died. His name was Jesse Lopez. And this kind of meeting was never there for him. There was not this kind of outcry. Every time I see a youngster die, I, they never get this kind of attention. The family never gets support. And I don't understand why it's happening now. And I honestly think there's racist undertones in this meeting, especially when they're talking about criminals. So who, are, who are the criminals? Who are the people that are pro in probation? It's brown kids. And they're not saying it. Like, say it. You're saying that brown kids make you feel like you're in danger. And you want the cops there to protect you from the brown kids. That's what I'm hearing. That's what I continue to hear from them. And it's honestly very sad. It's very, very sad. And I'm heartbroken for the family right now. They need support. They need love. They need parents that were here to be there with them. They don't need to be here weaponizing their trauma that they're going to experience for the rest of their life. Thank you. Uh, I just want to thank uh, Trustee Orozco for correcting uh, the thing on my name. And <laughs> I feel really strongly about that. Uh, first of all, good evening, members of the board. My name is Herman Rafael Gonzalez. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm a senior at Watsonville High School, and I'm also one of two Watsonville High School's ASB presidents that are here tonight. I spoke out last year in support of removing SROs from campus, and my position has not changed. Police officers should not be on campus. Having a police officer on campus contributes to a deep anxiety for our most vulnerable students. Reinstating SROs would in no way promote this restorative healing that we need. The day of freshman orientation, I was introduced to Watson's high school SRO, and a million thoughts ran through my head. Why do we need a police officer on campus? What's so dangerous that we need them? These questions and these thoughts create this deep sense of criminalization in our students, especially our students of color, the same students I've gotten to know and serve for my whole high school career. These feelings should never be present. So long as someone wearing the uniform walks on campus, a sense of community isn't created, but criminalization for our students is. And not one of the parents here speaking in support of SROs truly see that. They don't get to experience that. We all agree that the mental health of our students should be our priority. And one of the trustees talked about lack of respect. So we must show respect and justice for these students. What we need right now is restorative healing, restorative practices, and prevention through mental health support. We've seen tonight, that's what the peer numbers show. And after what has happened, not just in these past few weeks, but through this whole pandemic, what we as a district need is healing. I ask you to keep us, the students, in mind and not make a short-sighted decision. Please vote no. Pablo and Lucia, Lucia. All right, okay. Hi everyone, my name is Pablo Orozco Castro. I'm a clinical social worker with Fuerte Wraparound. I've been practicing four years in collaboration with the COE developing wellness center at Sequoia Schools. Um, today I'd like to present data regarding student engagement with the Wellness Center during the 2018-2019 school year and the 2019-2020 school years while I was a Wellness Center coordinator at Sequoia Schools. To basically summarize the data, utilizing two courts, cohorts of groups that were used to counseling services less than five times during the school year and more than five times during the school year, 
using an unpaired sample t-test, aka that's just a fancy word for just comparing the groups using statistics, an SCL group of 22 and a, the, the control group of 21. Results indicated that youth who had utilized the SCL services received more credits at a statistically significant level compared to less than the group that only utilized services five times throughout the school year or less. One thing that I keep hearing as, a, as challenges is SEL counselor visibility and stigma. Integrating SEL counselors into everyday experiences of students teaching curriculum and guest speaking to talk on SEL topics and normalizing to reach out. Studies show that SROs on mostly white campuses receive more support and are integrated more into school activities. When these SROs are placed at Latinx and black predominant schools, the opposite is true and there's often more tension. I have worked with youth at PVUSD and shared with me that they do not feel safe um, with S SROs on campus. One youth felt targeted the presence of a SRO and they are not adequately trained. Some only receive a few days of training in adolescent behavior and brain development. To, and to the white parents who came to requesting SROs that all your, all your kids will be safe. It's our bodies that will suffer the consequences. It is connection, not intimidation, that brings change. Lasso uh, Kamati, thank you. And if you want more research, check out the ACLU research on cops, not counselors, how, to lack, how the lack of school mental health staff is harming students. And Jeremy Finn and Timothy Severos, misbehavior, suspension, security measures in high school, racial and ethnic gender differences. And if you want more information, just reach out to me. We got the research. Good evening, superintendent board members. My name is Lucia Emeka Martinez. I go by any pronouns. I'm a senior at Wattsville High, and like Hedemann, I'm the other ASB co-president. I speak for many of the Wattsville High students when I say that we do not want school resource officers back on campus or any PVSD campus. <laughs> Countless studies have been done to show that SROs do not have any lasting positive impacts on the lives of students. In fact, they have the opposite effect. SROs promote the criminalization of students, especially in a district where the majority of the students are students of color. By putting cops back on campus, you are directly contributing to the school to prison pipeline. Students should be educated and not incarcerated. In my sophomore year of high school, I saw a student being arrested by the SRO. I was shocked and worried about that student. I understand that there are certain situations that happen, such as the tragedy at Aptos High, where an officer may need to intervene, but these are very few isolated incidents where an officer presence is needed, not enough to have them year round. Instead of paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to have comps on campus who do virtually nothing to help our community, provide more socio-emotional programs, more counselors for students, more mental health resources, more counselors and more teachers, because most of my friends, they don't have teachers in some of their classes. Superintendent and board members, the mission statement of PVSD, I looked on the website, is to educate and support learners in reaching their highest potential. We prepare students to pursue successful futures and make positive contributions to the, global, to the community and the global society. By putting cops back on campus, you're not making any positive contribution to the community or the global society. You're doing the exact opposite that your mission statement says. No cops on campus. Thank you. Exitali, Fernie, and Ellie. Hello, PVUSD board officials. I'm here today to talk about the ways in which students and the presence of SROs on spe specifically South County school campuses distracts students from focusing on their education, criminalizes them, and leaves them feeling isolated. I'm gonna talk about my own personal experience for a little bit. I graduated from PV High 2019. My senior year, um, fall semester, I was assaulted by a teacher. Um, and the way that police officers were shoved down my throat, I was told to go to a police officer for help. Um, as soon as I went to that, the police officer told me to turn around, um, told me that there was nothing he could do about that situation, and he left me abandoned. South County PVUSD students have poured their heart out to you guys. 
to talk about ways in which SROs on, on school campuses affects their education and their ability to focus during class. Please listen to, this, to these real life experiences of these real life students attending these real life schools and these real life situations. No SROs on campuses, thank you. Hello, my name is Ellie and my pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm a parent at PVUSD and have kids in elementary, middle school and high school. I also grew up in PVUSD and Watsonville. I would like to start off by acknowledging Gerardo, how young he was and how much I've heard his classmates praise him as a friendly kid invested in his AP classes. This is an unfortunate tragedy that our community is facing and has faced for a long time, losing our kids way too young. I would also like to echo what other parents have been saying, which is that it's disgusting to see how little the district has done to acknowledge his death and how quickly you politicize this tragedy along with the sheriffs to bring us to where we are today. Instead of opening up space and allowing our community to attempt to heal, you forced us into this conversation without giving us a chance to mourn or even breathe. I'm here to urge you to take seriously the data, the facts, by education researchers who have paid attention to the effects of SROs on racialized youth. Police on campus target youth of color. Police practices kill kids of color. This is a racialized issue. My child is in your care and has been targeted by SROs to the point that we needed to remove them from the district. It is very easy to speak from a place of privilege without acknowledging that the people of color have historically and actively continued to bear the blunt of this violence. The lives that have been changed from this event are lives of students of color. The life that is being leveraged to bring forth a violent system is a life of color. We people of color need life-affirming solution, not job calls that are derivative of long racial battles between two communities that perpetuate a system that continues to criminalize our community. Because let me tell you, the tears people are sharing today about Gerardo are tears we cry every time one of our youth gets killed in the street. But it doesn't make the news because it's not in the white school. There's a lot of reactionary comments by parents from Aptos being presented as fact We're when the time. data shows the data shows say SROs don't belong in schools. Thank you. Hi everyone. My name is Sitlali. Yes, um, I use she, her, hers pronouns. Um, I had prepared something today, but I'm gonna go based off the experiences of my students. Um, after the events that happened at Aptos High, um, I had to have this really difficult conversation with them and just hold space for them to share their thoughts and, and what they were feeling. Um, and to my surprise, a lot of what they were thinking, like they, they were a lot more compassionate, okay? They were looking at the entirety of the situation. They recognized that having cops on campus does not in fact keep them safe. They wanted to know what the students' experiences were. They wanted to know what their home life was like. Did they have mentors in their life? So we need to really look at this and, and, and address this from the root. We were shown data today that having SROs on campus puts our brown and black youth at risk, okay? And a great example, we were shown that today an officer came to this facility, addressed a white man, and allowed him to stay and put people at risk when we are mandated to wear masks. And he did not wear it until Edgar pointed that out, okay? So our brown and black youth are targeted way more than our white counterparts. These are statistically proven. So by allowing them to come back, you know, doesn't matter if, if you're white or, or, you know, person of color, unfortunately the crimes that are committed are at the same rate, but only certain communities are targeted more. Thank you. Cynthia, Joy, and Evelyn.
Hello, my name is Cynthia, and my pronouns are she, her. Um, my freshman year, I went through a really dark time at PV, and not once did I feel the need to go to an SRO for help. What helped me was the social emotional counselor at PV High, who I worked with closely. She checked on me regularly and made me feel safe from my, with myself and others. There were times I couldn't meet with her because she had to go back and forth between PV and WH, this school. At PV High right now, there is a month long wait list to speak to a counselor. My English teachers were also underpaid and they still checked on me too and helped me more than SROs ever did. Throughout my whole experience in middle school and high school in this district, the only memories I have of SROs were them harassing other students based, yeah. And my question is, how will you prevent that from happening when it does? What consequences will there be for the SROs? Will you listen to students? How will you keep SROs accountable? I asked the board to make their decision based on data and protect our disabled students, our students of color and our LGBT community. I ask you empower students by following Empower Watsonville's recommendations and increase counselors and keep SROs off campus. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Joy Flynn. I am an extremely dedicated community member. I am the parent of an Aptos High School alumni and a current parent of an Aptos Junior High eighth grader who lives in a black body. I am also, and who also suffers from an invisible disability, which makes him more likely to be targeted by an SRO. I'm also a founding member and speak on behalf of the Santa Cruz County Black Coalition for Justice and Racial Equity. First of all, we are looking at this from a wrong angle. SROs versus no SROs are not the problem, nor are they, and they are definitely not the answer. The problem is systemic racism, which equates to a lack of resources and funding to access programs I could go on which leave children idle and vulnerable to being policed. If anyone thinks otherwise, I suggest taking a deep dive into your privilege and do the work to understand what it is I'm talking about. SROs normalize and per perpetuate the culture of criminalization of black and brown bodies and prime the school to prison pipeline. SROs are not equipped, nor are they trained in the same way that a social and emotional counselor is. This is an opportunity that we have here today to create and implement and normalize a culture of accessing social and emotional support and improving mental health of our children. When children feel cared for, they thrive and they learn and absorb and retain information. It is in the caring for our children and children feeling cared for and emotionally supported not the policing and criminalization of them that we will positively impact our students in our community. I heard earlier a statistic about speaking words that um, students may say that would cause threat or harm to the school, but where do the kids go when they're gonna harm themselves? And someone said, one SRO for every 10 kids on probation, why not one counselor for every kid on probation? Thank you. Oh, I'm gonna speak on behalf of Evelyn Hernandez who could not be here, she's a Renaissance student. The P PVSD is having the idea of bringing back SROs on campus. I, for one, do not think this is the best solution for what has recently happened. Instead of diverting our resources to on-campus police, we should be investing in counseling where it doesn't bring up the idea of having police where some students may feel uncomfortable. Instead, why not divert those resources to maybe even getting more staff as a whole, as the whole district is understaffed. Having SROs at schools makes students five times more likely to face criminal charges for, quote, disorderly conduct. That can affect the student's ability to learn if they have to be going to court constantly. 
Many students have also said they feel uncomfortable near law enforcement. Research says that when there's SROs roaming around campus, students are more likely to be arrested and brought to court for behavior that was disruptive but not violent. According to the surveys, the district did all, did all three high schools, PV, Aptos, Watsonville, more than half of the students say they don't make us feel safe. And more than 70% 70, 70 of high school students say SROs don't have any contribution towards our academic success. Hiring them is a waste of money. Are you really going to invest $405,265 annually in SROs when this quote safety they are supposed to give isn't even guaranteed? School fields need fixed. More social emotional counselors are needed. Those are good investments. Thank you. Radhika, Isabel, Felita, Hovita. I think it's a V. Hovita. Good evening, Board of Trustees. Uh, we've heard from a lot of voices tonight, but as Nellie mentioned earlier, this is a very large district, a district with close to 20,000 students, and there are a lot of voices still missing, a lot of voices that still need to be heard. It has been only two weeks since the tragedy at Aptos High, and we are still suffering as a community and still experiencing the trauma and the tragedy. I think it is going to be detrimental to make a rash decision at this point that looking at these options does not encompass the whole child, does not encompass the restorative start that PVUSD promised. I'm urging the board to vote, to extend this vote, to take more time to listen to this community. As uh, Vice President Shocker mentioned, this community is divided. And it is your job as trustees to bring this community together to come up with solutions that will work for this whole community, not just part of it. Thank you. Buenas noches a todos. Distrito ocupa un intérprete. Gracias. Good evening, everyone. Siga. Uh, buenas noches. Mi opinión es que sí, que que las escuelas sí. Yo tengo un estudiante en Aptos, en Aptos High School. Y, Y pues mi, yo en mi opinión, yo pienso que en vez de los oficiales sí ocupamos más consejeros que el fondos que tengan o algo el distrito que pongan más consejeros porque los niños están um, a veces dañados en la familia, a veces hay, yo he mirado familias con uh, que tienen problemas y eso daña a nuestros a niños y es mejor que pongan más um, Consejeros. I have a child in Aptos High School, and I am opposed to the um, the officers or the SROs in the schools. I prefer that there would be counselors. I have seen families um, who are children who have been damaged in families because of the families. So I prefer that there would be more counselors. I también uh, en En las oficinas de las escuelas también a mí me gustaría que, que el personal pongan como cuando uno va y dice a ah, el niño ocupa ayuda o algo que también haya más atención porque yo he, he este, pasado por esa situación y dice uno algo no está bien en mi estudiante o algo como uno conoce a sus hijos y dice no, no está pasando nada. Y uno a veces sí ocupa que alguien le haga caso a uno en las escuelas. 
I would like that someone be at the offices that would pay attention to our complaints. I have gone and um, complained about my child and the answer I've received is that no, there are no problems when there really are because I know my child. Porque yo un tiempo fui y, y este, yo había dicho como si hay un bullying en la escuela o he mirado cosas porque yo siempre estoy como um, como pregunto cómo está o así los estudiantes o como tengo um, varios niños que no son mis hijos pero yo les hablo a ellos y dicen esto y, y cuando yo, yo una vez incluso fui a la oficina a decir en la escuela hay bullying y me dijeron no, aquí en la escuela no hay bullying y eso a mí me preocupó mucho, dije si yo estoy diciendo a la persona que que pongan como más atención de que hay bullying, me contestan así y, y uno se siente como, dice, ¿y ahora dónde voy a acudir? Porque si yo miro esto y no me están poniendo atención, ¿dónde voy a acudir ahora para poner esta queja? Si, si un joven me dijo que sufre de bullying. Um, I have been told by different children, and I know of a youngster that suffers from bullying. I've gone to complain about the bullying, and they tell me that there is no bullying. I'd like to know where I can go for help if they are not going to help me, and that really worries me. Eso es todo. Gracias. Buenas noches. That's all. Thank you. Sean, Stephanie, and Marilyn. Hello, my name's Sean, and uh, it might come as a surprise to you guys, but I'm not from Aptos. I'm actually here in Watsonville. So I want to say from personal experience, I want you to please bring the SROs back. Bring them to all schools. And the reason I say uh, that some people think they're scared of cops, well, I was scared of cops too when I was young. You know why? Because me and my friends were the ones that were doing things we shouldn't do. You know who wasn't scared of cops? My wife, a Rodriguez Ramirez from Watsonville. You know why? Because she was not doing things she wasn't supposed to do. People who were doing things they weren't supposed to do, scared of cops. People who weren't, not scared. I propose that we quit saying cops are doing things wrong because all we're doing is teaching our kids to be scared of cops. The cop that came in earlier with the kid from the soccer field looked like a perfect gentleman to have here at this school, right here. My school had a cop. All four years my high school had a cop. His name was Floyd. People have said cops weren't impressionable. I remember his name, okay? His name was Floyd from 1991. You know why he was impressionable? He was the cop that was there every Friday he would sit out in the parking lot and talk about the football game, talk about a rival we're playing, talk about things that interested the kids, made kids feel more comfortable with cops. I see no problem with bringing cops back here to Watsonville and to Aptos too if they want to have them there. I want to finish with one thing. We all bleed red. United we stand and divided we fall. We all want the same thing. We all want safety. So if we can get united, we can stand. Hello, my name is Stephanie Lefever. I'm a special education teacher at McQuitty. I'm a former student and track and field coach at Aptos High School. I was hopeful to get a teaching job at the same district that has been such a big part of my life. Unfortunately, this district has been nothing but a disappointment. Special education classes throughout this district are grossly understaffed. In my years working as a teacher in the autism program at Hyde and in a mild mod class at McQuitty, a daily occurrence for me is to be severely concerned for the safety and well-being of my students. This is due to the lack of instructional assistance. As the special education union representative this year, I know this is happening across the district. Every single special ed teacher I have talked to has expressed the same concern, their immediate need for more classroom aides. Instead of spending time and money on staffing these open positions, you are voting to place school resource officers in our schools, something that has been proven to disproportionately target BIPOC students and students with disabilities. 
This should not even be up for a vote. Please do not allow SROs back on our campuses. If you really cared about the safety of our students, you would spend your time and money on comprehensive mental health services, smaller class sizes, and more classroom aids, things that actually have been proven to improve safety at schools. Thank you. Marilyn Garrett, I taught 20 years in this school district. All schools should be wellness centers, and toxic exposure prohibits well-being. The tremors I have, my health providers told me, are from exposure to pesticides. When I taught at a Messy school, the wireless microwave radiation has similar biological effects. So to add on to what this previous speaker said, if you really want to have safe and healthy schools, you would remove the Wi-Fi radiation. Here's some facts. Public health warning, wireless devices emit microwave radiation, a known biological hazard. Every time you use a wireless device, you are exposed to microwave radiation. The World Health Organization labels this radiation a class 2B possible carcinogen in the same category as lead, DDT, and chloroform. Cell and cordless phones and other wireless devices, cell antennas and towers, smart meters, microwave ovens, and Wi-Fi routers all create electrosmog. Microwave radiation is harmful. Scientists link this wireless radiation to health problems both short and long-term. Cancer, infertility, damage to DNA and fetuses, sleep problems, memory and cognitive impairments, heart problems, immune deficiencies, and many others. And I'll leave you with a statement from Citizens for Safe Technology calling for removal of Wi-Fi from the schools. And this is also related to anger and emotional disturbances. We're at time. Pulsed microwave radiation like that emitted by Wi-Fi and this is a mother speaking, has been demonstrated through thousands of published peer okay, reviews. We're at time. Okay, I'll leave this with you and anybody else who wants this. This is a major cause of all kinds of disturbances in health. Yesenia Jimenez, Donna Lefebvre, Mueller Gleason. Uh, hi. Um, so right now, because uh, I work as an environmental educator for a nonprofit, I'm located at PV High. I currently have four nephews and one niece that attend Watsonville High School. Two of them I live in the same house as, so I see them as my siblings. And of course, I'm concerned for their safety. Um, and so that's why I'm against bringing cops back onto campus. I mean, I have four, four of my like nephews at Watsonville High. and. They're young men of color, and so statistically, they are more likely to get shot by a cop than a student that goes to Aptos High School. And I wish that more of the parents from Aptos who had made comments earlier would have stayed to listen to other perspectives, um, because it doesn't affect their kids in the same way. Um, I feel really bad for the family that this happened to, because Gerardo's the same age as two of my nephews, and I, I couldn't imagine it. Um, Another thing I want to say is that SROs are like really expensive. So here you have a bunch of teachers talking about how there's not enough positions filled. My, the students that I work with as a, as a teacher myself, and then my nephews who go to this school and my niece, uh, some of them struggle, they need extra tutoring and they don't have the resources to get it. 
And so we're talking about how the issue isn't cops, it's funding. Um, and I think Jennifer mentioned that we should all write letters to our legislators. Well, I wanna encourage you guys to set up a template and send it out to all parents. Because during COVID, we all found out that like, for one, we're, people are kinda lazy, right? But um, if you set up a template for a petition or an email, people are more likely to sign that than to sit there and write one themselves. So if we wanna get more funding for our schools, which obviously everyone agrees that we need more counselors at least, um, we should do that. Um, cops are not the solution, and that's all I'm going to say right now before I ramble. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jimena Ospina. I work at Pajaro Valley High School, one of the counselors. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the community, the parents, the students, because uh, the public school is a, ma is a matter of community. We need to invest in how students know and care about themselves and their community and the school community. I hear the need for SROs, security, and improving a safety system, but we are missing how to prevent, educate, and take responsibility of what happened in our campuses. Last week, I attended a circle of grandparents for peace as the violence has increased everywhere. As our one parent was mentioning today, bullying is an issue in our campuses. And I question many times, how is that um, the SROs have not been able to educate more the community on campus about this factor? Um, if they haven't been able to control the violence that is happening in, our street, in the streets of our community, how are they going to be controlling our um, school campus environment. Um, as a counselor, I had lost two students on the street. Uh, one uh, was at Watsonville High School after a in, in a game um, about, and he was a junior student. Um, and he was in the community, he was outside. Then I have another student this year, um, sophomore student who was killed also on the street. Uh, we need to bring teachers to the classrooms, allow to reduce class size, uh, bring more opportunities and more um, partners of the community to work with the students on campus. They, they will pr uh, provide other vision, other possibilities for the students to see their opportunities and what are they going to be doing after high school. Um, I love the idea of partnering up with the community because I think that they really bring um, the faces of what is going on out of the uh, campus community. The wellness, right, center, the wellness Center is important. I would like to see something closer to the area of Pajaro Valley High School, Rolling Hills, Cesar Chavez. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mueller Giesen, and I'm a uh, parent of a couple of students that are in the Pajaro Valley Unified in the Aptos region. First of all, I'd like to apologize to the folks that um, were offended by some of the people that were sitting around me that may have given a, um, I told them to be quiet several times and I did think that was very disrespectful. I went over here and I had a nice talk with the gentleman over here um, that we may see differently on certain things, but I think we see more eye to eye than more people know. Um, my message is one of unity and to say that it really saddens me that we've got to this point of it's this way or it's that way and we can't come together to say, hey, yeah, Aptos students and Watsonville students are in a totally different paradigm like the gentleman said. Um, I didn't make it that way. He didn't make it that way. It just is. We're trying to go through life thinking of this vat or this the reason I didn't wear a mask is because I believe it dehumanizes us. That's it. The reason the gentleman didn't give me a ticket is because there's no law that he can write me a ticket. He can't give me a ticket. He can't even ask me to leave because a mandate is just a guideline. So I apologize. The reason why I did put my mask on was because he made a very respectful request that made sense to me. So I did it out of respect. 
And I think that we should all have more respect for each other. And when it comes to the resource officers, yeah, it, it does affect the children, the, the, the Brown family's children, because there's inherent things that are built into our society that we all know are wrong. I believe that the resource officers should be there at a much younger age. They should be there as children, little children, before they know that an officer is bad. They should be there as a guiding light of, hey, you could do this one day. I grew up with most of the sheriffs in this town and Santa Cruz. I've known them my whole life since we were five or six years old to some of the ones that are retiring out now. And I know some of the younger ones. My phone is also a graveyard. We're at time. I didn't get 30s. I just like to say my phone is a graveyard just like yours, bud. I grew up here. Violence is not new in our schools. I was in a truck that had 29 bullet holes put in it when I was 17 years old or so. And thank God 13 kids in that truck lived through it. But please come together. Quit making it white or black. Okay, we're at, we are at time, and that's the last speaker for 6.1. Oh, sorry, Donna, I didn't see you down there. I'm very sorry. Go ahead. Um, okay, hello. Um, my name's Donna Lefevre. I'm a teacher here at Watsonville High School. Um, I want to echo something that was brought up by a previous speaker, that every student on campus should have an adult that they can trust and that they can go to. Um, I had that while I attended Aptos High School as a student, and I'm so grateful to those teachers and coaches that I had. Sadly, that is not the experience for every student. Increasing security is not where we should be spending our district money. We need to fill the teacher vacancies. We need to prioritize smaller class sizes at all grade levels. And we need to increase the number of support staff that can push into the classrooms to work with students. Children in our community need more positive attention from adults when they are at school. That is how we can support their social emotional needs. That is how we will build safe and effective school communities. The restorative start had good intentions and the ideas for conversation topics were thought provoking. However, at the start of the school year, there were 100 vacancies in the district and now there are no subs available. As a result, classes get split up into others, teachers take on classes during their prep, or whole classes are sent to the gym or quad because there are no, there's no one available when a teacher is out. This has not allowed the staff working with kids to be there in a supportive way or follow up when a problem needs to be addressed. This is not a restorative start. We were not ready to provide the support that was needed when we returned to in-person learning. We need to look at using the resources that we have as a district to maximize support in the classroom and be able to provide that trusting relationship for all students. This has to happen in order to build the safe school communities that our children deserve. Thank you. Thank you to all our speakers on that item. Do we have any uh, discussion from the board? We have you under the next item. It's okay, there's no number, so we had you in 6.2. So come on up to Kashi. My name is Takashi Mizuno, and I, I have sent you all the trustees various kinds of in, information for the past six months, including this topic. And, uh, I, first of all, I personally appreciate that uh, three options have been presented for discussion, and this is inclusive. And I have three recommendations to you. Uh, the first one is some people mentioned about in intergenerational trauma, and I recommend you to uh, consult with Dr. Donna Sindra. He's one, she's one of the experts on intergenerational trauma. 
and she has worked with Amamuson Tribe Band for the past several years. I have befriended with her for the past two years, and I have communicated with her regularly on this topic for the past several weeks. And she has uh, worked with Maori in New Zealand, Navajo in New Mexico, and Amamuson Tribal Band in uh, California. And uh, Amamuson Tribal Band, they have uh, wellness meetings regularly with Dr. Donna Sindra. And I see that most of the young people of that tribe have excellent, they, they are excellent young people, and some of them got PhDs, and some of them are PhD candidates right now, and they are excellent. And I really recommend to uh, consult and talk with Dr. Sh uh, Donna Shindra. She's one of the experts on this issue. And intergenerational trauma have been suffered not only uh, by, oh, only 30 seconds, on the second uh, recommendation is just to invest money in early childhood, childhood education. I uh, helped my daughter's class in one of the schools in PBUSD for three years, almost every day for three years. I need the needs of teachers and the parents and the students. They really need, they really need help, help. And the last one, I recommend, I, I make a couple of speakers that extend, extend this discussion and extend the voting. Thank you. Do we have any comments from the board? I, oh, Trustee De Serpa? get through this without crying. First of all, um, hearts are with um, Gerardo and his family. Um, to Sarah Leonard, who said the district didn't reach out, that's not necessarily true, Sarah. And so I just want you to know, I'm not gonna say more about that, but there's been a lot of reach out. We care about that family. We care about every kid in this district. This board, this administration cares about every kid, every family in this district, and we feel horrible about this, hor this tr tremendous tragedy that occurred at Aptos High. We have collaborations in this community. People have come up to say that we should. We already do. We've been collaborating with probation for years. We've, we have our own dedicated mental health agency, Pajaro Valley Prevention, who also collaborates with probation and us. I'm on the board there, so I know this because I'm at the meetings. We have collaborated for years and years and years trying to make this a better place, a bit with more opportunities so kids aren't prison, um, school to prison pipeline. We all wish we could say more about the events that transpired in healthcare, I work in healthcare. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. When things go wrong in a hospital, we take a look at that as colleagues from every angle. And it's not about pointing fingers, it's about how do we figure out what happened so it doesn't happen again. This administration has done that. We have looked at this particular tragedy from every angle, and I feel satisfied with what we've come up with. And for those of you who say that we're not doing that, I'm, I'm sorry you feel that way, but it's just not true. We all wish we could say more about the facts, but first of all, we're precluded from sharing the facts due to laws around juvenile and student protections. We simply cannot. And unfortunately, our county sheriff who is also supposed to not share information that is protected about juveniles is sharing information, and he shouldn't be. And I'm asking the county council to look into the matter to make sure that no more protected information comes out of Sheriff Hart's mouth in this matter.
Regarding the cell phones, it is the cell phone situation in all of rural Aptos, Coralitos, and other areas in this county. Our county leaders have not invested in the infrastructure necessary to keep any of those residents safe, including me who lives in a rural area. I have no cell phone service at my house despite years of asking for it. I have no internet that is reasonable and no, neither do any of my neighbors. It is not this district's fault. We have been asking for this. We have been looking into it for years. It, it, the cost, Dr. Rodriguez talked about looking into it, I think, before she got here. The cost was prohibitive. We had no budget to spend millions of dollars on putting a cell tower on Aptos High's campus. But I don't think it's just the district. It's our county's failure to put this infrastructure in place on our behalf. I'm the senior uh, board member. This is um, my 11th year on the board. So I do have a memory about a lot of the things I'm talking about. I will also talk more about Sheriff Hart. I feel bad, I feel sad that he chose to point fingers and blame this board and this district for the death of this young man. SR, we've only ever had one SRO on the three comprehensive campuses, only one. Right? We have a huge number of kids on those campuses. In this case, one SRO could not have prevented the death of this young man. And, and for anybody to say that it could have is pure speculation. <laughs> to hear him up there explaining or mansplaining about what happened on the campus, and all the other politicians who have called these, these members of this board to explain to us how we should be handling this issue. It's very, very annoying and unfortunate. I feel like Sheriff Hart gaslighted this issue, and it's a horrible, horrible tragedy, and it's just not appropriate for him to do so. I'd also like to point out that multiple people, multiple inmates have lost their lives in the county jail under Sheriff's Hart's jurisdiction. He can't keep the people under his own custody safe. So for him to tell us that one SRO can keep an entire campus safe is just not true. We lost Luke Smith, a sophomore from Aptos High, shot dead by the sheriffs under the influence. Yeah, name them. The sheriff says money is no issue. He's got a $10 million budget. Yet year after year, this district is billed for the SRO on the campus. I want that $3.5 million back that we've been paying him. Or maybe it's even more, I don't even know. It's like I, I just calculated 100, 150,000 over 20 years. I think that the actual price of the SRO is likely greater. This county does have a demonstrated history of racism. In 1999 or something, this county was called out because we had too many brown kids from Watsonville area in our juvenile hall, almost 70%. When, in that, when during that time, I think the population of Latin, Latinx people, Latinx youth was only like 34%, we had like almost 70% in the juvenile hall. And as a result of probation reforms led by the Annie E. Casey Foundation and studied greatly, we had this huge success about not locking brown kids up any longer. Sorry, I have a lot of notes here. I did vote to take the SROs out of our campuses. Part of, I had a personal experience that informed that decision. 
two, well, actually two personal experiences. First of all, our state superintendent put on a two-hour presentation about the SRO programs, not just in California, but nationwide, and how damaging they are to black and brown students. And I was very moved by the compelling data that was presented. I actually, I, I started my career as a child welfare social worker. I went out in tandem with police. I have a healthy respect, actually, for law enforcement, for the most part. I've seen the ugly things that, we, that we've seen together, and, and they do protect people. However, after seeing Tony Thurman's presentation, I was very moved by, by what was presented there, and everybody's talked about the data. It's real, and it, there's mountains of it, demonstrating that kids who are black and brown are hurt by policing. But you know, you think about, well, on the other hand, this is Santa Cruz County. We're more evolved, we're in a bubble, we're more progressive. That can't happen here. Well, I've already cited the data from our juvenile hall. But about two or three years ago, long before George Floyd died, my daughter and her friend, who happens to be African American, were sitting in Seascape. She went in the house for a few minutes to help her stepsister. And in that time, a sheriff officer or sheriff deputy pulled up, pulled her friend out of the car put him on the curb, asked for his license, ran his background for no other reason except he was black in Seascape. I have that lived experience. That young man has that lived experience. My daughter, unfortunately, has that experience. I was very, very upset about that. And I called Sheriff Hart and asked why that happened and he dismissed me. He said there was no call, he couldn't find it. He, he, in his mind, it, it couldn't have happened. So it was sort of like our word against his at that point, but it was very, very disturbing. So here in progressive Santa Cruz, these things still happen. Having said that, I have a greater concern, and that concern happens to be about gun violence across our nation. And almost every day somewhere, there is a shooting on a school campus across the nation. And I think all of us, as a community, need to address this. It is a systemic problem. Do I think SROs on campus are good? No. Do I support having at least one armed person on campus? Yes, with reforms. I think our school administration needs to have a hand in choosing the SRO that goes on the campus. I think the SRO should not be in a uniform. They need to have training, they need to like kids, and they need to make a sort of a pact to do no damage. And I like the, I like Option one that we came up with here to have a mental health professional partnered with an SRO. So I guess that's the end of my comments. And thank you, I wanna thank everybody here for having the courage to come up to the microphone. And I'm really, really um, sorry for Gerardo's family and for this district in general. We're trying to do good. We are not the same district we always have been. There's a negative narrative that, that kind of follows PVUSD around, and I'm sorry for that because a lot of wonderful things are happening in this district. Thank you. Any other comment, qu comments from trustees? Okay. Um, For myself, there's always more to learn. I have spent 
the last two weeks in particular, although it's been much longer than that, but in particular, the last two weeks, listening to site leaders, um, law enforcement officials, community members, parents, union leaders, their members, and students, both past and present, hearing many perspectives on this issue. These conversations have confirmed my belief that this is a complex situation with many different viewpoints on managing it. From my experience as a nurse, I know that when we're looking at priorities, we have to distinguish between urgent and important issues. With SROs, we have two seemingly conflicting issues, safety and equal justice under the law. For safety, we have seen an increase in behaviors that are concerning, not just from students, but also from parents and from community members. I have heard from many stakeholders who have shared examples of how SROs have been a valuable resource, that they are one tool among many for ensuring safety on our campuses. For equal justice, I know that we have all heard many comments in the last couple of weeks dismissing the negative experiences shared by students at the July 2020 meeting. I would encourage everyone to consider the possibility that we are all prone to availability bias. The idea that all we see is all that there is to see. I come from a nursing perspective, and that holds that pain is what the reporting person says it is. Acknowledging another person's pain and experiences does not negate your own. Just because I may not have seen something happening doesn't mean that it's not happening. These two seemingly conflicting issues are both urgent and important. People have mentioned the, a solution does not need to be either or, that it could be and. Is compromise possible here? Can we create a context where SROs are part of our restorative process, practices, where they are integrated into our school communities in such a way that the R in SRO, resource, is what's most emphasized. I would feel right about reversing our decision from a year ago if our district has a voice in the selection process, and furthermore, this cannot happen at the expense of the gains we've made in additional social-emotional supports and other preventative measures. If we do this, I want to see a collaborative, integrated approach that we trial this year and reevaluate at the end of the school year to see if we need to make further refinements in our contractual agreements. If we can do those things, if we can do this in a way that is mindful of all potential impacts, then I can support you know, a reinstatement. Thank you, President Holm. It's echoed some of my thoughts there. Um, you know, I see the concern from both sides. And like I said before, we're a community divided. I'm lucky because the color of my skin is white and I acknowledge that I have white privilege. That does not prevent me from listening to those who have different feelings than I do or different views than I do. It does not prevent me from learning. We all need to stand up, especially us with our white privilege, and we need to be able to be, have, be courage, have courage to make a change, right? I spent um, last summer, when this question first came to the table, with various student focus groups, asking questions, listening to them, listening to their suggestions. Because of their, some of their suggestions, we have made progress in this district. We have a health and wellness center opening at EA Hall that was student-led, student-driven. We have more social-emotional support. We have more counselors. Yes, there's a waiting list. We'll do what we can to expand our hours, to expand the opportunities for students to not have to wait. Because in an ideal world, we wouldn't have to wait to go see a counselor. 
We wouldn't have to wait to have our health, our mental health taken care of. So yes, there's problems. Yes, I admit, there's problems. There's things that we can do better. There's things that I'm at a standstill for what to do or what decision do I make. Right now I feel that there's, we're living in extreme distrust of institutions, of each other, of police, of our neighbor. And the internal question is, how do we fix that distrust? In order to fix that distrust, we need to really, really listen to each other and listen to each other's perspectives and work on a solution. And if we bring SROs back on campus, as President Holmes suggested, as Trustee DeSerpa suggested, there are things that we need to implement to make sure that the R in resource is what the SRO is there for, not policing students, not arresting students. An SRO should be more of a community service officer, providing a service to students and their families, engaging with students, talking to students about the dangers of gangs, the dangers of social media. How many people are quick to pick up their phone and video, but they're not quick to step in? These are all things that we need to address, and these are things that we can use community resources for. We have TikTok challenges out there that are crazy, destroying schools, encouraging kids to choke themselves. Who knows about these things? Do parents know about these things? No. Not really. Students know about them. Police sometimes know about them. But who's there to educate students? Is that TikTok video really worth your life? Is that really worth destroying property? I don't know. Do you know? So these are questions we need to think about. We need student voices. We need community voices. So I propose that during this time, we also look at having a committee that has student voices, teacher voices, parent voices, district voices, community voices. And we really look at the situation and we evaluate how this year goes and we evaluate what we need to do different and what works. And in order for this to work, we need to hear those voices and we need participation from all of you. So I'm proposing that in addition to the other items that we have listed as implementation, that we do also implement a committee. And I know some people are tired of, of committees and this and that, but as we know, we learned a lot from the policing ad hoc committee. And that's something that we can learn from each other and make suggestions for. Um, Nothing's ever permanent except the loss of life. And I don't want to be in a situation where another student loses their life. Thank you. Thank you for joining us and staying past uh, 10 p.m. with us tonight. Um, you know, when we made the motion to remove SROs from our high school campuses in 2020, for me, it was about what students needed and how to best utilize those funds to address those needs in a time when we were facing budgetary cuts. Back then, we were seeing an increase in domestic violence, an increase in mental health referrals, an increase in substance abuse, food insecurity, elevated suicidal ideation. We received, at least, I don't know about other board trustees, but I know I did, at least three emails from um, parents expressing their concern about their kids' safety. Some leaving notes saying goodbye because they were attempted, um, attempting to commit suicide. And while I recognize that this may not be the experience uh, of all families, we cannot negate the fact that others were and are having a hard time. And after 18 years in isolation, those issues are even more prevalent now. And we're seeing it across our campuses at all age levels. 
in our homes, out in the community. We have our kindergartners, first graders, learning how to be around each other, using their bodies, pushing, pulling, yelling, screaming, shoving at each other, instead of being kind and using their words. We have parents yelling at our staff members who are doing their best to control traffic to get our kids safe and in time for class. We have teachers and staff learning to be around each other again, and at times they're less patient. And then we have tragedies, like the one we just experienced at Aptos High School. What we're seeing is a mental health crisis. Many kids are facing food insecurity, poverty, domestic violence, trauma, exacerbated at times of stress, loss of loved ones, Really, we're seeing more of everything. And will placing an SRO on our high school campuses solve this? I'm not sure that it can. And I wouldn't expect them to. This is bigger than that. And I hope our community understands that. We must work together. If we're truly invested in improving the safety and security of our students in and out of our campuses and prevent tragedies, we need to address the root cause of the symptoms we're seeing as a community. We should be investing in prevention, diversion programs, mentorship, restorative practices, in mental health, wraparound services, parent involvement, access to extracurricular activities, after-school programs. <laughs> Addressing poverty and food insecurity. Those are the root causes. You know, I was looking at the options we have up there, and and I feel that as it is, we have already compromised enough. And, we're, we're, and we're, we're talking about bridging that gap, right? That division that was seen tonight between South County and North County. And when I look at those options, I feel like option two is already doing that. We're increasing security in our campuses with the potential to increase security in our middle schools. With option two, we're also addressing the mental health needs that we've heard from multiple speakers tonight and also from what we're seeing in our schools. We're placing security cameras. We're already taking all those pressures. And I just don't feel comfortable compromising. So, I think we owe that much to Gerardo and his family. In fact, we owe that much to all youth. That we've lost to violence. So let's buckle down and get to work. The SROs are not the solution. President Holm, I'd like to make a motion to extend the meeting to midnight, please. Actually, actually I'm sorry, 1 AM. I have a first, do I have a second? 
A second, please. All right, I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Oh, okay, um, motion carries. I, I didn't hear any of opposition. All right. Any further comment? All right, um, I'll entertain a motion on item 6.1. I couldn't quite. Oh, I'm sorry. I'd like to make a motion item to support agenda item 6.1. To support the recommendation of the district? Which is? To choose? Which yes is, so, so yes or, or no on the SRO issue? To reinstate or not? Yes. To reinstate? Yes. Okay, so I have a motion to reinstate the SROs. We're choosing from these three options, sir. The first step to do yes or no. And then the second one will be which one of option. Right. So just to, to clarify, in case that wasn't picked up by the mic, the, the first vote is yes or no on the SROs and then the options from there. So I have a, a motion to support reinstatement of the SROs. Do I have a second? I'll second. Okay, I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries 6-1. Um, on item, so we'll move on to item 6.2. Allocation of funding to implement new safety plans. Report will be presented by Dr. Michelle Rodriguez. Yes, thank you. So um, this next item is regarding the funding, just approving the funding as we will be using um, ESSER and in-person one-time monies in order to be able to do this. Um, you will see that some of them are, um, are a cost which is salary and some of them are um, one-time costs. Um, we are recommending all six of these um, different elements of safety measures as well as with the vote, um, we are recommending the pilot of pairing the SRO with the mental health clinician um, at the cost which you see um, down below because um, we will be bringing um, some of this forward as, um, as it is staffing and we'll do it within the staffing reports. Um, but we need direction and approval to, to begin to allocate the funding so that we can move forward with the options. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? Yes, we do. Um, Edgar? Good evening once again. My name is Edgar Ernesto Ibarra Gutierrez. I'm with Milpa. And um, as we start looking at these plans, I really want y'all to think about, now that y'all have taken the vote, to reinstate SROs back again. One, uplifting the overall well-being of every single young person here. The overall well-being of these plans, when you start implementing video cameras and everything, all the technology fails. We all know that. So when you're looking at these costs and all that, start thinking for the long term. Every time we have budget cuts, social, emotional well-being is the first thing to go. And all these punitive ways of going about it, of when they get supporting our young people always prevails and stays in the forefront. So please, when those budget cuts do come, because they will come, we all know that, uh, make sure that we always establish a social emotional well-being. All those programs are well funded, not just for one or two years, but for the long haul. You know, that, that's what I'm advocating here for. And again, with all this technology to monitor and and you know be, be at the forefront of all young people, hey, that, that technology can also be misused and there's also been studies that shown that that technology has also targeted black and brown people at a higher rate. So just be very cautious of how y'all use this and go about implementing a lot of these things because y'all just I, I made a very big decision once again within a year that uh, it's gonna have impact. You know, you know, what's the next thing that's gonna happen that's gonna make y'all ch change your mind? So y'all really just gotta think about it, hold true to your values, to your palabra, 
You know, what does your word mean to you? That's true. That's my mom told me. You know, I didn't grow up without a father and all that, but my mom told me, Nomás tienes tu palabra. Y honra tu palabra. So for y'all up here, think about what you say and how you talk to the people. Honor your word. Honor your ancestors. Honor your people. That's what's important. Palabra. Bernard. Well, in conclusion, right, let me introduce myself. I haven't done it yet. My name is Bernard Gomez. I'm, uh, I go by Bernie. Uh, I work with MIRPA, Motivating Individual Leadership for Public Advancement. I am formerly incarcerated. I'm a proud father of two uh, PBUSD graduates, right? Uh, I myself went to Aptos, Watsonville, went through the whole system, through the whole gauntlet. Uh, Aptos, you know, is pretty racist. You know, it's, it is what it is. You know, that's, uh, uh, and I think, you know, you all know that. It's, uh, it's like the Salinas High of, of it's like Sal in Salinas, this is the Salinas High of, 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 of PBSD, right? But to say all that, you're about to, or you just did actually, undergo another shift, uh, and now you're thinking about giving or spending money on a department that already has a $100 million budget, right? You're uh, thinking about also uh, another department that takes about 47, 43, 47% of the Watsonville uh, city budget. What is your budget? You know? I mean, it's like, it, it just don't make sense. Uh, but one thing I do request, though, is that take a, uh, that shares a, a hard word to it, you know, and have them do that for free, you know. This this board is this board should not spend money on the cops. Let them do it. They offer, so let them spend it, and you can actually save money. You can actually do something, and like my my colleague said, you know, you can be about your word and be about the about the kids, be about everything you're saying, just not about the SROs, you know? SROs is really not the solution, but I understand y'all have a really difficult task, you know? Uh, a lot of pressure, you know? Um, but as someone with lived experience, you know, the system, SROs, cops, they did nothing for, they did, they did nothing for me. You know, the community, my people, my family, right? My own ganas, you know, did everything for me, thank you. Ali, enjoy. I blinked and y'all made a decision that was so disheartening and just like devaluing all of the people that were here speaking for hours. Dodge, you had nothing to say. You continue to embarrass us. It's, it's just sad. Um, the reality is that PBUSD has been facing problems for a really long time. The pandemic only amplified them. You should never be satisfied. You should always push yourself to do more. Look at who showed up today and who's still here. Aptos parents knew they didn't have to entertain the idea of a 10 p.m. meeting because they know their privilege and how you give them more power to their voice than ours. There's more people here asking for you to take down SROs and to not bring them back and y'all just completely bypassed us and ignored us because y'all have personal relationships with the police that you can be accused of embezzlement and nobody has to bat an eye because you're friends with the cops, right? My children have been bullied at different times during their time at PBUSD. My oldest faced homophobia, transphobia, and traumatizing experiences from classmates, administration, and SROs to the point that due to my child's safety, I was forced to pull them out of the district. The school failed to keep my child safe, and it's a perfect example of how cops do not equal safety. My child did not need a cop as they were being bullied and harassed. My child needed, needs, and deserves 
counselors. The violence that police historically and actively imposes onto our transgender and LGBT community, especially those of color, has harmed us for generations, and you are perpetuating that violence by ignoring our students when they've asked you to keep police officers off campus. I blinked, and y'all decided to bring SROs back. You have nothing good to say ever, Dodge, ever, in the year-long meetings that I've watched you, pero luego, luego, con tu familia de, de policías, ¿verdad? Por eso puedes hacer lo que tú quieras, ¿verdad? Porque tu familia te puso aquí y puedes hacer lo que tú quieras. It's an embarrassment and y'all have failed. Orozco, thank you. Hello, my name is Joy Flynn and I'm very disappointed in this decision. None of you will know what it's like to be the mother of a black boy or the grandmother of a black boy. Now I have to worry about my black son also being policed at school. Trustee Orozco, gracias. Teresa, Nelly, It's Sean. Okay. Hello again. Last week when I spoke um, during our time at um, last week's board meeting, I had asked for this to hopefully be a night of just the beginning of a discussion. Um, but you had already made up your minds. I was at Watsonville High School yesterday and I saw um, our, that this is a school that is so hard hit with vacancies and I know that there is one um, community member, not from this area of, of the school district, who emailed you and me in response to um, what I had to say in regards to the, the impact of vacancies on our Watsonville schools and his answer what to me was oh yeah you're really concerned about the students not having teachers but that's just how it is you know the teachers they want to go and work else in another area and it so you know it creates vacancies and but that's just how it is and i like deal with it so i was here yesterday and there was one teacher watching three different classes because there are still vacancies here at this site. And so students who should be receiving instruction in a core class are instead being watched um, by one teacher and they're not receiving the, uh, the lessons because there is not somebody that has been hired but this is where we're gonna spend the money. We asked for that 5% cost of living adjustment on, our, on top of our base funding, that for some of that to be put on the salary schedule to make it more appealing for teachers to come and apply for these vacancies. And that only falls on empty ears, but this is what we get. Thank you. Hello, Sean again. I want to thank you guys for doing the right thing with the SROs. I would implore you to bring them to all schools. Um, I disagree with the lady that spoke earlier, but I do kind of have to agree with her on the point of you guys don't seem to listen. You seem to sit and look at your computers the entire time while the public comments. It's almost like you've had your mind made up the entire time. And it doesn't matter what we say, your minds are made up. I got that same feeling when we came and talked about masks. You probably remember me and my story from then. Now it might click. We talked about masks. You guys voted like that. You had your mind made up already. That night, plenty of people were against masking the kids. Not very many were for it. You voted to mask them. Tonight, I'll admit, plenty more people were against what I want. But you voted for it. So I'm not sure if you really represent your constituents. 
I want to thank you, Mr. Soto, for voting for no masks on the kids. It's the healthiest thing you can do. You want to talk about kids' safety? Take the masks off the kids if you want them to be safe. You, you're a doctor. You should know. Like, kids wearing dirty masks is unsafe. My kid's in first grade. I guarantee you his mask is so disgusting, you wouldn't even touch it when he got home from school. Thank you. Any discussion or comments from the board? Does anyone else have comments? Yeah, so I will be voting yes, but again, I want to express uh, the fact that I'm not in support of the SRO portion of this item, but I am voting for it because um, of the other uh, safety measures um, that come along with this vote. Did you have a comment, Trustee Jones, before I comment? A motion? No, I did not make a motion. Okay, well, we're fixing mics. I just wanted to say um, we're voting on option one, but I'd really like to consider um, with option one that we add in the committee on SROs um, to get more community input. And I'd really like this to be what it says, a pilot program, and that we come back at the end of the school year and we evaluate what has happened, is it effective, what's going on, and that we're not signing five-year contracts, that we're signing a contract that is for the school year and I would like PVUSD to have a seat at the table for interviewing SROs. Um, I think it's important um, that we have someone that reflects our community. And if we have police officers that are truly interested in kids, like we've heard from some of them that they really want to help, um, I'd like to see those officers apply for the position, hopefully. And I'd like to get someone that's culturally relevant. I'd love to see someone that can bridge the gap and make a difference and see if this program is really working or if we need to reevaluate this once again. And I know it's, people are like, oh, it's another big decision. You're right, it's a big decision because it's about safety and it's about children's lives and it's about being the mom of a black student who she said, now I have to worry, I, her name was Joy, she said I have to worry about my student at school. And, the, and parents shouldn't have those fears and SRO shouldn't invoke those fears and it's our job as a board, since we voted this in, that we make sure that SROs aren't invoking those fears because if they are, then that's not the job we want them to do. Like I said, their job should be resource. So I really want to make sure that's what's happening here. Otherwise, we need to make a different decision. Can I add a really quick cool comment? Yeah. Yeah, there was, um, going back to the many articles, many emails um, that I read, um, we know that school culture impacts the role that um, an SRL takes on. So in addition to what Trustee Shocker said, I think there needs to be really um, some training with the administrators at each site so that um, the SROs do not get involved with the, dis the disciplinary actions of students um, because that's never okay. I think there's a fine line and it needs to be well established and well known. And we had spoken before also that that's not a pair thought and um, when we were exchanging ideas, and I had some parents also exchange ideas, um, we mentioned um, in the conversation that I had with a couple of parents um, that SROs undergo culturally relevant training that some of our teachers are going through. So I'd like to see something like that happen too.
Do, yes, Trustee Dodge Jr. Yeah, uh, just, just briefly, um, after talking with my neighbors, voting constituents, I even had a brief talk with my daughter about this issue. People across the Pajaro Valley, youth organizations, and with the support of local Wansville teachers, classified staff, Wansville High School slash EA Hall administrators, along with support of the majority of the Wansville City Council members who reside in my trustee area, I'd like to make a motion to support option one. Oscar? Right. Trustee DeSerpa? All right. So I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right. With that, um, we'll adjourn the meeting. And our next meeting will be a regular board meeting on September 22nd, 2021 at the district office boardroom at 6 p.m. closed session and then 7 p.m. public session. The meeting is adjourned at 10.50.